Pedro. I'm Daniela Weigner, one of the Managing Directors and Co-Founders of Synergy. I am here to welcome you to the Synergy Technical Conference of 2021, which we are holding virtually for the very first time. Our technical conferences started by welcoming you to our offices in Munich over 10 years ago. Then we expanded into a three-day conference program. These events have always been a great source of knowledge, not only for you, our partners, but it also gave us an opportunity to pull the brightest of our minds together and ponder on the future show our advances and, most poignantly, gave us the chance to meet with you in person. The networking aspects of the TechCon, indeed any of the events that used to consume much of our professional travel time, is something I'm sure we all sorely miss. On the plus side, we now have the chance to reach more of our partners and friends from all over the world, and I wanted to thank you, all of you, for taking these hours out of your day to participate in our technical conference today. Our programme this year has been put together by our professional services team in the UK, who some of you may have come across already. Having established the professional services team in Bristol, we have grown capacity there to take care of our partners and customer needs, where one may need additional assistance in architecting, workflow, questions, implementing synergy solutions to fit your organisation's strategic goals, as well as more mundane yet essential installations, deployments, as well as project management. One of the threads throughout today's conference, in addition to the expected product enhancements and updates, is very much influenced by today's business needs. It is no revelation that remote working, cloud-based technologies and virtualization have become essential in all parts of our businesses, the catalyst of course being the current pandemic situation. Whilst we could not predict this, what we could predict and indeed have been working on for many years, is how we can leverage our solutions to work virtually make our software solutions robust, flexible and provide you with the best returns on investment. Synergy as a software defined platform has really pushed software optimizations, removing hardware and network dependencies, coupled with clever and continuous developments over many, many years. It means we continue to be relevant and cutting edge whilst balanced on the edge of seismic industry shifts in working and business practices. We are seeking we're seeing a generational change in how we approach our working days, how we can serve our customers' needs. Our industry, as well, is going through a period of anticipated, albeit accelerated change, with an era of mergers and acquisitions and other less positive outcomes of consolidations. We hope to show you today how we can help you meet some of these challenges with Synergy Solutions, with overviews of product improvements, as well as practical examples and applications of cloud-based workflows. I will now hand over to Lewis Cacaldi, our Head of Product Management, who will introduce you to the conference topics. In the meantime, I give you all my best wishes until we meet again. Welcome you now to the Synergy Technical Conference here. Uh, I'm very pleased to have people joining us virtually. Uh, sadly, of course, because of current global events, it's not physically. Uh, just so you know, what we've done is we've worked really hard on this technical conference to actually mix in a blend of pre-recorded presentations as well as live elements. So as I sit here right now, I am genuinely live in our studio, uh, albeit with a cut down crew in the office because of the COVID restrictions. So what I'd like to do is encourage you all throughout the course of this technical conference to send in as many questions as you can throughout the event. As we have a live studio presence, it would be great to actually hear from you guys to justify the fact that we're here live and that we're working 
So if you send your messages in to techcon at synergy.com or hashtag synergytechcom on Twitter, we'll do our best to try and bring you guys interactively into this event and try and answer questions and give feedback because we didn't want to just run a pre-packaged, pre-cooked event that had no feedback. So I am genuinely sat here right now fumbling my lines already. Uh, as you may have noticed, obviously I'm not a professional broadcaster, so please forgive any uh, lumpy moments as we broadcast through this. But I'd really love to hear from you guys and we'll have Simon come in over the microphone to ask questions and bring in feedback as much as possible as we go throughout this event. So we're really trying to make up for the fact that I'm not having the opportunity to meet you guys in person as we travel around to international trade events or having technical conferences. So this is the, what we decided to do to kind of make up for that as much as we can, to give you guys an update of what's been going on inside our company and to give you a feeling for where we're going and how we've pivoted given what's been going on inside our environment and inside our industry. So you get a chance to poke some questions through those channels and have them relate to me, and I'll be putting them to our various team members that are contributing to the event. And on that subject, I'd like to take a moment to just run through the agenda that you can look out for today. So as we go throughout the event today, we're going to be cutting into people joining us live over my shoulder in the studio. What will be happening, first of all, is you'll be listening to me talking here as I run through our agenda, and then I'll be providing a keynote speech to you letting you have an idea of what's going on in our company and how our strategy is aligning on all those fronts. But once you finish with me in the studio, we'll switch over to our combination of live participants joining me using webcams and SRT and Synergy Air engines to contribute into our live studio. And we can have a little back and forth with these people before they present the packages they've spent the last few weeks building. We wanted to respect you, the audience, as much as we could. And while we would normally take an agenda like this and spread it over a couple of days when we ran our physical technical conferences, what we've done is we've really tried to pack into just over three and a half hours a lot of information. And so we've taken a 45 minute presentation from team members and crunched it down to between 15 and 25 minutes each time to just really try to help you get through and get into the information as much as possible without the normal problems of a physical event where we have to switch presenters and plug microphones and cables in. So even though we're running for three and a half hours, we're really getting through over a day's worth of what we would normally do in one of our physical technical conferences. And we hope that you make the most of that. So we'll have team members drop in and I'll introduce them and they'll introduce their packages. We'll run that pre-recorded package. But while those pre-recorded packages are coming in, those team members will be preparing to answer the questions you put to them. So if you have questions about their presentation, just email those in, tweet out messages, just reach out to us. And when we come back into the studio, I will put those with the help of Simon to those people, uh, just again to help prove that we're really live and to get your interactive feedback into this event. So we really do appreciate you taking the time to listen to this and to watch what we've got to explain to you. So the first of our presenters that we've got coming up in this event is someone that you may have met at our trade shows. It's Mr. Michael Jacobs. He's our head of professional services, the group that we run out of Bristol here. And if it weren't for the pandemic, he'd actually be in our office today rather than joining us from just a mile away from his home. But he's going to be taking you through his presentation and package that's known as Cloudy with a Chance of Broadcast. And he's going to update you on all the different things we've been doing with the cloud and with virtualization and DevOps strategies to try and help you move to broadcasting with that in mind. So we'll talk to Mike up. He's first of our team members. We'll see him and he'll bring his package on. After we've done that, we'll be moving over to Yaroslav, Mr. Yaroslav Kornietz, who's currently product manager of Synergy Multiviewer, as well as working inside the professional services team with me and Mike. So he'll be taking you through the changes that have been made to Multiviewer and the newest version of Multiviewer and the optimizations that the development team have put in that allow an ever higher amount of density for streams using off-the-shelf hardware. So he's got some interesting science and facts that he's going to take you through with his presentation. And you guys then have a chance to fire questions at him about multi-viewer professional services or about the features that are coming in these upcoming releases from there. So he'll come back into the studio and we'll talk to him before we then move on swiftly a little bit further to Polina, who will be joining us from the Ukraine, where she's working from home again because of the COVID pandemic. And she's going to be talking to us about Traffic Gateway, the next generation. We've done quite a lot of work on our Traffic Gateway product over the time, which is the interface between playlist scheduling and traffic scheduling 
and then the automation parts of our play out. Uh, we've actually completely rewritten this and Polina is going to take you through the changes we've made and how that can help your business and help the workflow transformations that you might want to go through as you upgrade and overhaul playout chains and as you consider, for example, moving things further into the cloud. This automation element becomes ever more important and we'll hear from her about how that's been going. Moving on from Polina, the next person that we'll meet is Mr. Michael Zolotuski. He's our head of development and he'll be joining from Munich. I believe he's actually in the office because he has a, a, a nice office there that he can seal himself in to keep viruses at bay. Uh, and he'll be joining us from there and he'll be talking about one of the more interesting presentations of, of the bunch that's looking a fair bit more towards the future. So he's talking about what we can do today with re remote production and he'll be talking about what we've already shipped, but also what's coming up very shortly and is it release candidate and giving you more of a taste of what's coming in the near future and demonstrating some prototype applications that we're bringing to production right now and talking about how we've done that. And I'll actually be joining him in his presentation where we had a two-way conversation about this. So you might want to really think about some questions you want to ask about that uh, because there's quite a lot of changes that come up at the end of that, introducing some new things for us as a company. After Michael, you then get to hear from me. Uh, so I'm going to give you guys in a presentation I've created a bit of an insight of how we've made this technical conference. We've used a lot of Synergy technology, but we've used some other technologies using NDI and open source platforms like NDI, uh, OBS, as well as the Wowzer streaming cloud that you're hopefully watching this on. So we're going to actually talk a little bit about what we've done in the studio and how we did that and some of the technology that we've created in order to film this because we're filming this in a, a somewhat innovative way. So I'm going to talk about that myself and you'll hear from me in the package I've created there and then I'll be ready on standby to answer any questions you might have about that as we come back from me. I'm nearly at the end of the agenda because we've saved the best to last, someone that needs almost no introduction, Mr. Jan Wagner. So those of you that have come to our technical conferences in person before will know that Jan quite often closes out our events with his take on what's been going on in hardware. And so his presentation titled Bytes and Pieces takes you through what he's seen recently in innovations in hardware and goes through all the various devices he's bought inside the lab in Munich where we've been benchmarking and testing things. It gives you an insight into what's on the roadmap for hardware that might make a difference in you guys planning whatever you might do next with your deployments. So Jan's our last presenter, and you'll also have a chance to reach in and ask Jan pretty much anything you want uh, at the end of his session. Uh, so that's going to be getting us quite a long way out. The, the, the agenda runs for quite a long time. Uh, so depending on how many questions come in, we'll be closing up three and a half hours from now, pushing out to four hours if people ask a lot of questions. And I really appreciate the time that you're giving in joining us in these streams and listening to us as we give you guys an update and an information. But it goes two ways. Do keep feeding back questions, and we'll do our best to answer them. Where we can't answer them live, we will endeavor as much as we can to answer them back through email or reach out to you through the social media that you asked us questions on. So even if we don't manage to get your question answered because of time or because it arrived after we'd moved on from that section, we'll see what we can do to get back to you. So do just send them in. We really want to hear from you guys because we've missed you not being at these trade show events. It's been a real shame. So after we uh, finish with that, uh, now I've finished going through all the introduction to the agenda of what's going on, it's time for me to go into a bit of an update of what's been happening in our company and to give you what's been labeled as my keynote address as I go through what's going to be going on and what we've been doing strategically. So it's now time to turn to me on the other camera and listen to my keynote. Of course, during our technical conference, you'll be hearing a lot of things from us about what we're doing that will tie into our golden thread of remote cloud and DevOps. So this thread is the theme that we've been following strategically at Synergy. And I won't trample on what my colleagues will be presenting to you guys later as part of their presentations. But what I can do is update you on what this means to us as a company and how we tie this into everything we do as we move forwards. So our golden thread is remote cloud DevOps. Everything you hear from us today should somehow relate to one of these three things. And everything we've been working on strategically at Synergy can quite often be tied back to these three elements, even if at first glance it can't. So for example, one of the things we've been working on at Synergy in this last year is our own subtitling service. 
Now, this is 1980s and 1990s technology at its finest. Teletext and DVB bitmap materials and outputs that have all been around since long before I started in professional broadcast. And you might think, well, what's this got to do with remote working, with cloud, with DevOps? But actually, one of the reasons we've developed this is that we found as we've moved Synergy Air into the cloud that not being able to seamlessly build up a play out pipeline with captioning and subtitling capabilities is an impediment to deploying a DevOps style output, an output channel that we didn't like the friction of. Uh, also, similarly, issues and friction around licensing slow that process down. Whereas if we have a first party solution, we can actually make it much easier and more streamlined. So the same way that you can spin up a Synergy Air or Synergy Capture play out or recording machine in the cloud, you'll be able to enable captioning. So even one of the things we won't have time to talk about today beyond this keynote, but that is facing what would arguably be quite mature technologies is still pertinent and actually even deployed by us because of service to the remote cloud DevOps golden thread of the company. So as we go through all of these things, everything we do ties into these important key strategies, even when it involves things that are so old that they're teletext. Of course, we've still got further elements that we want to talk about and further strategies that drive onto this. And one of these strategies is cross-platform. So one of the key things that Jan has set out for a number of years inside his company uh, from a technology perspective is that he wants to see us having a stronger cross-platform capability. So for us, we've been working on migrating key technologies to be able to compile cross-platform. And one of the first visible benefits of this is the fact that we're using Cinecoder right now running on an iPad. And as we drive this further out, the fact that we now have Cinecoder available on Mac, Linux, and Windows is the beginning of that story. And for us, everything we carry on doing helps to address that. And you've got to kind of ask, though, how does cross-platform fit into remote cloud or DevOps? But if we look at each of these, even something at first glance that doesn't seem to tie to these strategies ties up quite strongly. From a, a remote perspective, it's quite likely these days that people could be working, for example, on a Macintosh PC at their own home. And they might be choosing to use that operating system because that's what they have available. But we still need to be able to have a cross-platform story to reach that user working on a Mac platform. So we have things like Synergy Workspace that are browser-based and other tools you'll hear about from Michael that will enable people to work within that mechanism. But even though they're working remotely inside that different platform, we still need to be able to cross-connect between the Mac front-end to quite likely a Windows back-end running our services. So this interoperability is incredibly important. So when someone's working remotely, we don't necessarily get to control or choose what their platform is. Similarly, if we look at cloud, it's widely acknowledged and accepted these days that with the cloud, the most deployed operating system is Linux. So if people are looking to run a cloud-native workflow and to drive more and more into the DevOps model with modern concepts like microarchitectures, being able to deploy key elements of our technology on Linux is something that's going to help remove friction and remove stopping issues that can help our cl cloud migration. The third and final part of DevOps is tied strongly back into cloud. Being cross-platform means wishing to be able to then also run into containers. And being able to work in a DevOps model, it can quite often be very beneficial to deploy within container workflows for technical reasons I won't go into at this point. But the more we can do to embrace these possibilities, the more we remove roadblocks and frictions to reach the deployments people want to get to ultimately. And where people want to get to ultimately is very clearly being able to work remotely in the cloud, with the cloud, and deploying a DevOps model of working so that their deployments and reconfigurations can become swifter and faster. This, of course, ties me to my third element of my keynote address, which is more about being under customer control. When we talk about being able to move to the cloud, we don't want to tell people they have to move to the cloud. And actually, one of the key strengths of Synergy, we feel, is the fact that while we can help you cloud enable your business, we're not going to drive you into the cloud and tie you into our platform by locking the keys to our platform and allowing you only in through the front door. 
as we look at the broadcast marketplace, we see more and more of the industry providing these platforms as a service style solutions where you as the broadcaster or the content creator or even as the Synergy Channel partner may well find that you just hand over a credit card and then enter through a login page and then have to trust whoever is providing that platform to keep you on air. Now at Synergy, it may well be that some of our channel providers and partners wish to bundle up and create that service for people. And I'm not here to say that that does not have an incredibly valuable place in the ecosystem because it clearly does. But we also have to be able to cater for the broad spectrum of customers and deployments that we have as a company. So we need to be able to give people the ability to run on-premise where their business needs it or in the cloud entirely where their business requires that, or crucially in a hybrid model where they have some on-premise components and some in-cloud components that meet their business needs. And one of the things we do as Synergy is we leave people with the control to take our software products and deploy using DevOps capabilities into their own cloud and their own cloud account. Ultimately, this can take some more effort for customers that are doing this, which is why we are working with channel partners that can effectively bring in that platform as a service layer on top of Synergy. But as a company, we continue to fully support people that effectively wish to roll their own platform, manage their own infrastructure, albeit perhaps virtual. So network layers and operating system and virtual machine layers are delegated to major cloud players like Azure, Google, and AWS. But the customer themselves can choose to then still be running our software and maintaining and configuring our software and also troubleshooting and controlling our software without having to be in any way, shape or form connected to us as a company that might not be available for you in the way or the time you choose. So for us, we wish to leave you guys, the customer, with as much control as possible of your environment so that you can make best use of being in the cloud or deploying DevOps without being tied into what we give you as your only choice. And that for us is a really critical difference and USP that we as Synergy work hard to bring. And it doesn't make things easy for us when we rolled out Synergy Workspace this year, being able to deliver it continuously to customers on on-premise installations and through the cloud has caused us to have to really work quite hard to make sure that we can meet all of these different requirements. But we're continuing to commit to making these kind of overarching strategies and to keep working in this way so that you guys as the customer ultimately retain control and can still be the broadcaster even when your broadcast is emanating from a cloud that runs on equipment you don't own. The final part of my keynote is still connected to that customer control, but is something I felt was important and that I, I wanted to bring up in this address to give you guys warning of a strategy that we're in the middle of implementing and that we feel will ultimately serve you guys and will be only welcome, which is the move to support uh, long-term support slash latest features versioning style. So as we move on, as Synergy, we've realized that it can be quite difficult for customers where we follow the traditional major number increases so that as we released Air 15, that deprecates Air 12, the previous number, and customers have to be on 14 or 15 to receive support. But it may well be that they now, the customers are forced to make a bit more of a leap than they wanted. Uh, the, this isn't necessarily the least friction way that we can work with customers uh, because it's always been this version or the previous version. And one of the things we want to do is we want to actually ship more frequently. A number of you as customers will have been using Synergy Air 15 long before we actually released it as a golden release just a couple of months ago. And we were issuing go live licenses for some months before we reached what would be a version we were happy enough to say this is now effectively a long-term support version. We had customers running real programs and real channels for months on something that we didn't quite label release for these reasons. And one of the ways out of this is for us to actually change the way we label our software and to instead run two versions, one labeled as a long-term support version and one labeled as latest features. So when a customer has commissioned us to improve the software, they can actually take what would still be a supported, released, documented version of our software, but we can highlight to people that this is a latest features build and that people should perhaps consider how they roll up and roll onto a latest features build and how there may be a higher cadence of releases of these builds than they might wish to run 
done if they're actually perfectly happy with their installation, but they just need to keep up with codec updates, security updates, and general supportability bug fixes that they might be more interested in having. So as a customer that's perhaps on a steady state output, being able to run on a future version of Synergy Air that's labeled as long-term support, rather than just being on the N minus one version, is something we feel ultimately gives more customer control. And as you, the customer, might commission us to improve a feature, we can now more quickly improve that feature and ship it in the latest features builds and get a supported version to you or to other customers quicker than we could do while leaving people that are happy with the state of outputs without forcing them to take features that could potentially disrupt their workflows. So one of the first platforms you'll see moving into this style is MultiViewer. And when we come to Yaroslav's package, the keen-eyed amongst you may have noticed over my shoulder a few moments ago, I referred to MultiViewer as MultiViewer V21. So what we'll be trying to do is associate the major version number with the year of first issue. Now that's not to mean that that year means anything other than this was the year of first issue. And so it could easily be that we hold for multiple years a long-term support version as the long-term support version, where we just provide security updates and patches and minor improvements to that build without major breaking changes. And you could find yourselves in the future running version 21 of a product in 2023, and that's not a problem. We may well actually release 20, version 22 and version 23 after this, but still leave version 21 as the long-term support version. Uh, we'll also be including the, the approximate month of release as the subversion. So when we get to the point where MultiView is ready to ship, you will find that it has a version number of approximately 21.5, meaning that it was initially ready for a go live release candidate level in May of version of, of 2021. But we haven't perhaps got it out in May. It could come out in June. It could come out in July. And we'll even continue to issue point fixes on top of that without changing that middle number, depending upon what we've done to the code base internally. So it will be a change, and it will change what you guys will be doing, and we'll be updating you about this as we roll this out more concretely. But it's something that we're planning to do. We'd like to hear your feedback on this. And as we've mentioned before, we're here for Q&As, we're here for questions. I'm not taking questions at the end of this keynote, but we will have opportunities to discuss this. And so send your questions in as you wish. But I wanted to bring this to the front of everyone's attention as we do this. And also because I feel that even a change to version numbers like this also helps meet our requirements of DevOps. If we can help people understand the versions they're running on and when they can roll out updates and what the impact is, get updates to people quicker and get updates to people that need them while leaving people on stable versions that don't need major updates but just need point improvements. As we can separate out these things, this still, for me, helps people with DevOps workflows and helps people understand how they can roll things out in the cloud and still meets our golden thread test. So this for us at Synergy is what we're looking at strategically. Right now, the industry has gone through a number of improvements and changes, introducing 8K technologies, HDR, high color outputs, uh, IP adoption becoming just widespread, it's now normal. For us, we're looking to focus not so specifically on functional capabilities like this, but how we can bring these threads together to continue offering that end-to-end -end solution that we provide as an independent software vendor to bring you the tools you need in the way you need them in today's marketplace and in today's broadcasting environment. So that is the end of my keynote now. And that means it's time for us to move on to talking to our contributors. So I'm gonna take the opportunity right now to introduce the first contributor, Mr. Mike Jacobs. Mike, can you hear me? Hey Lou, yep, I can hear you. Awesome. Clear. So, you know, here we are entering into the, the body of what our technical conference is like. And as I mentioned before, we've actually got team members uh, transmitting using SRT, the brilliant secure, reliable transport technology that we use, uh, initially developed by High Vision and Wowser, into our studio here. So, if we do have any problems, uh, we're ready to have technical difficulties because the internet never likes to cooperate. But hopefully, if everything goes as well as it did yesterday in rehearsal, uh, we're not going to have any problems. So, uh, Mike, as most of you should know, is our head of professional services. How have you found the fact that you haven't been able to come into the office and spend quality time with me over this last year, Mike? 
Uh, it's not been too much of a burden, Lewis, to be honest. Um, I think I've probably missed seeing your lovely dog more than yourself in the office. It's always uh, always an adventure whenever he joins ah, us. Ah, well, yeah. I mean, you're welcome to actually take him off my hands and keep him the way he's been acting recently. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, obviously... You've not been able to come in the office here to join us uh, for the real event, but it means we get a chance to show off having like kind of you appear over my shoulder and be like real TV. Uh, so you've been working on this presentation and you've uh, produced your package. Do you want to give us a few words about what it is that we're about to see and then introduce it and we'll run your package? Certainly, yes, no problem. I mean, I always knew I was your favourite, which is why my package is <laughs> first. So um, today I will be talking about the cloud, uh, which is obviously a very large topic. So what I've done in my presentation is choose a few particular aspects which um, always seem to generate some queries and questions from customers. And certainly when we've interacted with partners and things, those are areas where uh, we found our, our experience to be beneficial. So hopefully people will find the information contained useful and it will help them on their journey either through or to the cloud. So I hope everyone enjoys my presentation. In, pre in previous years, talking about broadcasting from the cloud has been something of an oxymoron. People were not sure if you could even run simple broadcasts of single channels from there. It is no longer a question of can you run your channels in the cloud. In today's world, the question is most definitely what do you want to run in the cloud? And Synergy software forms a large part of that answer. Synergy have been enabling delivery of broadcasting from the cloud for a few years now and have customers who are running anything from a couple of channels up to complete end to end workflows there successfully. During this time, we've learned a few things along the way. And so today I'm going to cover a few topics which we feel can still generate questions from customers and hopefully provide some information which will be useful. Firstly, I will cover what is a cloud deployment using Synergy? What does that look like? How does it behave? Next, I'm going to move on to talking about tools as there are lots of them out there which can be used with cloud deployments. I'm going to cover ones which we find useful for repetitive tasks and monitoring of workloads. And finally, I'll talk about some areas which aren't necessarily given the attention they should and can cause issues further down the road. So what is a cloud deployment using Synergy, I hear you ask? Well, a deployment can vary from a single pop-up playout engine used for special events, all the way up to a complete product chain running from ingest using convert, all the way through management and editing with desktop and archive, to being played out with air, and recorded with capture for video on demand workflows. And obviously this is just a diagram showing pieces of Synergy software, but how does that relate to the cloud? Well, mapping the various blocks of Synergy software onto some example cloud services shows that for what may seem a complex deployment can actually be reduced down to only needing four different capabilities. I've taken AWS services for this example. So in no particular order, we can see that we have EC2 providing the compute requirements, RDS is delivering our database, FSx is acting as the network shared storage, and finally S3 is our long-term media store. As mentioned, so this is only an example, the S3 bucket could be replaced with any source of original media, and Synergy Archive could also be running on a compute instance. One of the areas which we at Synergy get asked about frequently is what sized compute instances are required to run specific player configurations in the cloud. Here are some examples of the types of questions we get. Therefore, I'm going to use the next few slides as an opportunity to give some examples of player configurations with related AWS instance sizes and loadings. Obviously, to carry out these load tests, I need to use a configuration for the player engine, and there are lots of options here. I have chosen a config which I feel is representative of a cloud player, and this is going to be the base config which will then be adjusted as necessary with any changes called out. Let's quickly run through this config. I have an instance name set, and under licensing, I have simply added the Synergy Air Pro control option. Moving on to the playback tab, I have one channel with a single IP output added. I've selected the available NVIDIA GPU to be used as my video effects accelerator. And I have a buffer of 50 frames 
in RAM. The feedback video will be encoded using Synergy's Daniel codec. The single IP output is running in unicast mode and it will act as a listener for SRT on port 6001. I haven't set a passphrase to encrypt the SRT output. Running the engine in this mode allows me to reach out and request a stream and I only need to worry about opening network ports on the firewall in this environment. I'm not going to be creating any custom output rasters, nor am I changing any of the default transport PID settings. I've chosen to encode my output using H.264 offloaded to the NVIDIA GPU. This will be encoded at a bit rate of 10 megabits per second with the various GOP structure set to IBPP and the various other settings as seen here. I am including a single stereo pair which will be encoded as MPEG layer 2 at a bit rate of 192 kilobits per second. Finally, under the CG tab, I have enabled the Synergy Titler engine to allow any graphics branding to be utilized. Okay, so before we turn on any air engines, let's have a quick look at how the machine is sat at basically idle. So we can see we've got a CPU load of around 10% on average, and the GPU is sat there just trundling along at about 6%. Okay, so taking a look at the loading on the AWS instance, we can see the CPU utilization is hovering around 30%. And if we move over to have a look at the GPU, we can see that the video encode is averaging sort of around 18%, moving up and down a little bit either side. Obviously, please bear in mind that these figures are being affected by my RDP connection into the machine and having to render the graphs, etc., that we are viewing. Okay, so having moved up to two HD engines running with two simultaneous HD outputs, we can see that the CPU loading has increased to, on average, 50% utilization. And moving over onto the GPU, we can see that the video encode has gone up to, on average, about 30%. So not quite a doubling of load. OK, so here we are again, now with three channels running on this machine. And we can see the CPU load is hovering around 73 74%. Um, so it's getting quite high now and probably going to prevent us from adding any more channels to this machine. The NVIDIA GPU is doing well. The NVIDIA encode is averaging around 40 to 41% utilization. There we go. Here are the results. We started with around a 10% CPU, 6% GPU utilization. And as we moved up adding more channels, it was the CPU that was topping out at an average of 72%. The GPU was only 42%. And this goes to show that we can deliver three simple HD channels from the smallest of the older G3 AWS instances, the G3S. So, could we fit any more? We could probably fit another HD channel onto that instance by carrying out some additional optimizations and moving some of the load off of the CPU onto the GPU. To minimize our use of what is a reasonably low amount of available CPU power, we could have ensured that our planet media was encoded as a GPU codec, such as H.264, and therefore can stay within our GPU pipeline within the AIR software. We could have also removed the feedback video from being generated. This will reduce some of the load, but needs to be balanced against operators' requirements. And finally, one of the other things we could do would be to move the player engines over to run as Windows services. And this removes the requirement for the playout dashboard application to be running and also no longer requires the machines to be logged in. So that was G3, which is an older generation of the AWS instances. Could we achieve more with the newer G4s, which are only, ava only ones available in some of the newer data centers? Possibly. But the challenge here is that because NVIDIA have removed support for interlaced encoding on H.264 in their newer chipsets, we need to move to a progressive output. So is this going to offset the newer hardware in this instance? I've repeated the same process as before of adding engines one at a time. So let's see where we end up. 
Okay, so here we have the AWS G4 instance. I'm currently running three HD channels in 1080p50 with three SRT outputs connected. As we can see, the loading is actually not too bad. The CPU is averaging about 60% load and the GPU, which is the newer Tesla T4, is averaging about 40% load on the video encode. So here we are with four HD streams running simultaneously from this G4 instance. And here we can see the CPU is averaging about 80% uh, holding strong. And if we look at the NVIDIA card, that itself is running the encode load at about 54, 55% on average, which is pretty good. There you go. We could achieve more with this instance, even with a move to a progressive output. We started with a baseline a bit lower than the G3, 3% CPU, 1% GPU utilization. And as we increased up to the four HD channels, our CPU moved up to about 83%, which is slightly higher than we had on the G3, but still an acceptable load. The GPU was averaging around 54%, which again is an acceptable load on that GPU. And these are good results and do show the benefits of using the newer hardware platform. But don't forget, that this is still the smallest of the available G4 instance sizes available. What about when we add graphics into the output, I hear you cry? Well, simple elements such as ratings and logo bugs use image files such as PNG. And as you can see here in this example, they will not make a noticeable difference to your instance load. But what about more complex graphics such as say an animated lower third? As you can see, when the graphic kicks in, the GPU load goes up to about 18% and the CPU load goes up to about 29 to 30%. Once the graphic is finished and clears, we can see the GPU is back down to the 13% before and the CPU dropped down to about the average 20 22%. So we did see a load increase on the machine when the lower third animated graphic ran. When the graphic engine first initialized, the CPU load went up to about 42%, but then reduced back down to 30% whilst the graphic ran. The GPU load goes up to about 18% before again reducing back once the graphic is cleared. Now we come to UHD. Is this going to be a challenge to deliver? Here are the changes I've made to the engine config. I've simply moved the player mode up to UHD and I've increased the output bit rate to 35 megabits per second, but still as a H.264 encoded stream. So let's take a look at the loading. Here we have the G4 AWS instance playing out my single UHD channel. And at the moment you can see the CPU load is going up and down around 30% and the GPU is staying around 14% utilization. You'll see the CPU load now is reducing down to 16, 18%, whilst the GPU load has increased slightly. This is because I've got two different encoded video clips being used in my playlist. One is encoded using ProRes and the other is HEVC. And as it moves between those two different encoding methods, the loading on the machine will vary accordingly. As you can see, the answer is no. With my sample media files loaded into the playlist, we saw the CPU loads go up to around 50% and the GPU average around 14% utilization. As I mentioned, the variance we'll see up and down is because of the two different codecs which the media files are encoded as. And don't forget that this UHD channel was still running on the smallest of the G4 instance sizes available. Right. I hope you found those numbers and examples useful, and I feel they go to demonstrate once again just how efficient and flexible Synergy software is. Whilst I could spend the entirety of my time showing you even more player configurations and loads, I'm sure you can trust me when I say that it is possible to run more than one UHD channel on a single instance. Therefore, let us move on now to talking about tools and which ones Synergy's have found to be of great use. The two areas I'm going to talk about are automating deployments and that old classic monitoring. Migrating workloads to the cloud requires testing and investigation. You have to run the same tests in different configurations in an iterative manner. 
And having a development environment and a staging environment are good practice. Being able to quickly create and delete them to allow fresh testing is extremely useful. Though also cloud providers have their own automation services, we always prefer an agnostic solution. And Terraform is a brilliant one. To quickly quote their website, Terraform is an open source infrastructure as code software tool that provides a consistent CLI workflow to manage hundreds of cloud services. Terraform uses various types of files to contain the information needed to deploy the elements which make up your environment. Here is a sample of the contents of one of the files used in Terraform. Here you can see how we are defining a G4 instance type, which will deploy it into a subnet, given a name, and we use the Amazon Windows Server 2019 image as a starting point. Terraform allows you to document your infrastructure as code and keep this information in a version controlled repository such as Git. By documenting your environment using these tools, you can easily create with one command and then delete them with the other. This is because Terraform keeps track of what it has deployed, and this is especially useful in cloud environments. No longer do you need to remember in which order you have to deploy certain services and that you need to create an Active Directory before you can create your database. We have used this tool many times and it is our default way now of deploying anything into a cloud environment. In fact, our esteemed Mr. Kakaldi even has a video on the Synergy YouTube channel showing him going from nothing to 150 player channels in 10 minutes. So please take a look. So moving on now to monitoring. As I mentioned when I was showing the resource utilization on the instances, the act of me being connected produces additional load on the machine. We at Synergy have talked before about big data and analytics, and these once again prove invaluable to not only providing real-time information about the instance, but also historical information to spot trends. So using Metric B to deliver data into an elastic search system, and then using Grafana to visualize this is a great combination. Oh, and did I mention it's free to use? So what does this magical combination of software create for us? Well, this image here shows the type of dashboard you can build with this data and shows the insights you can get into how your system is running. Here we can easily see how our GPU is handling the load across the top. And if we want to get some more detailed information about the CPU, etc., we can hover over any of the data points on the graph to see point in time statistics. Can we get more, I hear you say? Well, yes, in fact, you can. With Synergy Air version 15, we've added metrics which we believe are useful and can be queried and sent to Elasticsearch. Taking these stats, we can create graphs which show information like this, where we can see if we've had any drops of output frames reported, along with any variations in system timings, and if we're having any delays accessing any media. Then we can combine the information from both Synergy Air and Metric Beat, and this can give us a complete picture of both the machine and the software. This way, if we, we can correlate if we get an issue with what was happening on the machine at that point in time, which is invaluable when you're dealing with an environment such as the cloud, where you do not control the underlying infrastructure. So that was a brief take on the tools which we found to be invaluable in our time with the cloud. Let's finish off with some time spent on consideration. What are some things which you need to think about when you are using the cloud for broadcast? If you are looking to achieve maximum density and therefore least cost per channel of playout, then what do you need to think about? Well, source media encoding. Try and have a fixed in-house format which is GPU friendly. You get the same GPU capabilities from a G4 instance type, whether you start with the smallest extra large at say or 84 cents per hour, all the way through to the 16x large at over $8. Graphics. Be efficient in how you build your templates. Don't use full size raster plates to put a bug in the corner. Don't use full raster videos to put an animated lower third on. Hybrid deployments. Don't be afraid of keeping some things on premise. It can be useful when you need to convert signals back to baseband or if you want to use our new pseudo interlace mode in Air 15 and you want to use one of the newer NVIDIA GPUs in the cloud, we need to convert that signal back to interlaced when you get back to your delivery premise. Split the load. 
You can use all our software in a client server mode, which means you don't need to squeeze both your player engines and your operator software on the same instance. You could even run it on-prem if needed. Be mindful of the uptime or availability statistics on cloud services. We ourselves have seen things like AWS's FSx service become unresponsive for up to 20 seconds when a network reconfiguration event occurs. You need to plan for failure when you're working with the cloud. Unforeseen costs. Make sure you are tracking your costs for cloud usage and are aware of when you need to pay to get things either into or out of an environment. If you're using remote operator machines on premise, then delivering the confidence streams to them will cost you money. So just a couple of reminders now to finish. If you need help when you're looking to make the leap, then the Synergy Professional Services team are here to help. And if you're now keen to get started, simply search for Synergy or channel in the cloud on the marketplaces in the cloud. And I'd like to thank you very much for taking your time to listen to my presentation today. Mike, well, thanks very much for a, a highly polished presentation with lots and lots of information in there. Uh, as I was watching your presentation, I thought of a number of questions I could put to you, and then you answered them. So I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that our voice in the sky, who we've yet to hear from in this TechCon, and you'll get to hear more of, Mr. Simon Pilbeam, has got something he can put to us. So it's early days in TechCon. I don't know yet if we've been getting people getting familiar with mailing things through. Do we have anything or do we have some questions that you've thought of we can ask Simon? Right. Well, hello, everyone, and uh, a very good afternoon uh, here in the UK. Um, so far, it's quite quiet, but we had anticipated this a little bit. So we have got some questions we could ask. And one of the, uh, the major ones was, uh, if I wish to run more channels than you show on a single instance, what are my options? How do I scale up? It's a good question, uh, and I'm, I'm going to throw this one over to Mike, and I'm going to just add it as well. With, can you just explain a little bit more about? You know, it, everyone wants to know how many channels can I run, but how how can we answer that question? How much does changing parameters like simulcast and, and network caching? How much does that affect channels? So, how, you know, can you even answer how many are there that we can run on a machine, Mike? Oh, thanks very much for the questions, Lou and Simon. Um, so in terms of scaling up, uh, absolutely you can increase the uh, resources available to your uh, machine by increasing the instance size. Uh, you just need to be aware of what resources are increasing when you move up. So uh, if you move up in the G4 range, for example, then you'll get more CPU cores, you'll get some more memory, some more local SSD storage. You won't get any more GPU capacity. So you still get just the one Tesla GPU available to you. You have to move to one of their multi-GPU versions to, to achieve that. So if you're finding that you're short on CPU capacity, then you can move up. If you find that you're maxing out your encoding capability on the GPU, for example, then you'll either need to, as I talked about, move, move and split the load or look at a multi-GPU instance type. Uh, in terms of running additional outputs, so for example with uh, the simulcast that you mentioned, Lou, then that will add some extra load to the machine because you're having to do an additional encode for that particular output. So you do need to, again, be careful. It is possible to have one HD channel use up all of the sort of available resource on, a, on an instance by having complex graphics running, running a simulcast at the same time, uh, and things like that. And the network caching option that we have available, that will also increase some load on the machine, more on the CPU side of things, um, but it is a good way of preventing outages from loss of uh, some of the other services that you may be relying upon in the cloud. Yeah, so what you're saying is you really, really kind of need to carefully assess what it is you want to do and get a, a really solid grip on what your requirements are and have all of those listed out, enumerated, and considered before you can then work out how many you could you, you could run on an instance or what instance to pick. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You you do need to get your, as the phrase goes, your ducks in a row before you can really get down and start running things out. You need to know what's my channel configuration, 
how many simulcasts, how many graphics, you know, have I optimized my graphics? I mean, that's why I talk about in the presentation about having the ability to create and destroy environments, you know, in a very simple, you know, command line based way, because you're going to need to do that quite a few times, even when you know you've got what you think are your final requirements, when you come to actually run that load on a, on a cloud deployment, there may be something unforeseen that does crop up. Um, you need to be able yeah. to... I mean, and of course, once you start broadcasting, you really are live. So the, the big benefit I found working on a cloud-based project is that it becomes very easy to just create a temporary environment for a few days because you want to try out a new setting, but you, know, you, you don't really want to do that in production. So yeah, the, the, that's just one of the benefits of the cloud. If you're doing that, you don't have to uh, experiment on the live system. Mr. Pilbeam. Do we have any other any other nuggets come in? Uh, yeah, they're, they're you want to put slowly through? starting to trickle through. So do remember, everybody, if you want to ask questions, that's fine. Uh, techcon at synergy.com is the email. And hashtag synergy techcon is the uh, Twitter handle you need. Uh, that will allow us to answer your questions. Even if we don't get to answer them live, remember, we can always respond to you afterwards. So don't be afraid to ask, even if that item has passed in the uh, TechCon. Uh, people are asking which EC2 instance sizes you were using to carry out your load testing, Mike. Yeah, good question, Mike. Yeah, I, I, I kind of drifted off uh, for a moment and didn't hear that. Can you just repeat which, which Amazon instances have you got running on that? I can't believe you drifted off, Lou. That's, uh, that's totally unacceptable. Um, so I chose to start with the smallest, and throughout my presentation, I used the smallest of the available instance sizes. So I was using a G3S, and that was the first one that, that people saw. And then I moved on to running with the newer G4 uh, model. But they were both the smallest ones that were available to use because I wanted to demonstrate just how much you can achieve with our efficient uh, GPU capabilities. Yeah, yeah, so it's quite a lot of density there. Cool. Uh, right, Simon, do we have anything else on the burner there to throw in Mike's direction? Um, I suppose one of the questions I would, I get asked quite a lot here is um, that we mentioned AWS in the examples, but uh, are there any other cloud providers that we support? That's a good point, yeah. Mike was demonstrating how we prefer using Terraform to configure things because it's a multi-cloud configuration system. But Mike, you know, are there any other uh, actual cloud providers that you're prepped for and that you can talk about? Sure. I mean, yeah, at Synergy, when it was on-prem deployments, we've always been hardware agnostic. And now with virtualized and cloud environments, we remain agnostic. So I used AWS in my presentation just because that's the most frequent one that we've been asked about previously by people. Um, but if you want to use the Microsoft Azure platform, uh, then you're absolutely the software will run there. And if you wish to use Google's platform, then no problems at all in either of those. Or if you want to move to any of the private clouds that people have, then there is no problem running the software. There. Cool. Well, it's good to know, Mike. I mean, I know that at Synergy, we, we do work hard to try and make sure that we don't lock anyone into any particular platforms or any particular decisions. Mr. Pilbeam, are we near the end? Do you have anything else you want to drop through the letterbox? Uh, there's nothing burningly urgent apart from one very simple question. How does licensing work when you're using the cloud? Simple. Ah, licensing being simple. Uh, I'm going to throw that one over to Mike because everyone just loves hearing Mike's voice. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. Uh, so, yeah, licensing, absolutely. I mean, it's straightforward. We've tried to make it as straightforward as we can. So... You have serial numbers that you install onto the, onto the uh, instances. We have our Synergy license manager software that you utilize to do that. And the licenses will then sit there quite happily licensing the products. And you have uh, a period of sort of offline time available with the licenses. So obviously to prevent people from being able to just reuse serial numbers here, there and everywhere, then we do have the sort of a back end check in, if you will, once every 43 days, 45 days uh, for the serial numbers. And that just confirms it's still installed on the same machine. Um, and that's just a very small uh, background check over the Internet. And yeah, 
apart from that, you can use the serial numbers exactly the same way. As okay, so that's for if you're bringing kind of licenses you already own through serial number. That's not the same if you're using the marketplace images. That license just automatically works, right? No one has to get a serial number or enter anything, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for bringing that's that up. That's what I live for, I, I just to throw you, so, absolutely. throw you back some <laughs> things and yeah, catch any of your gaffes. Thank you. Yeah, keep me on my toes. So absolutely, if you use the AWS Marketplace, then a license is automatically injected and everything will just work straight away. You don't need to get in contact with us to use that. And the same with the Azure Marketplace. You want to use that and you want to use uh, the image that's available there. You'll get the serial numbers all provided as part of that process and you can just crack straight on with your... Uh, and on, your, the, on the Marketplace board. licenses, yeah, that's per hour billing, isn't it? Or is it even per minute? Yeah. Uh, it's per hour, uh, so it's all based on per hour billing. Absolutely, it's rounded up uh, with minutes, but it's uh, it's built on a per hour basis on on the Azure and AWS. Okay, yeah. So platforms. people really can kind of not not worry. They need to keep an eye on things. If you set a lot of air engines off and leave them all weekend, then you might have a bit of a bill shock. But if you're experimenting or you need to bring things up temporarily, the marketplace li place licenses can be a nice low friction way of doing that. So, Mr. Pillbeam, is it time for us to say goodbye to Mike? Or do I, you have anything else? I think that's about all we've got from the great communications hub here in Bristol studio. Cool. Well, in that case, thank you very, very much, Mike. Thank you for joining us in the studio virtually. And thank you for making that presentation for us that we could look at. Uh, I hope you guys found that interesting. Uh, we'll maybe pick up some more questions later on uh, if we can, if any others come in. Uh, otherwise, we'll come back to you later. But... That marks the end of the talk of uh, Mr. Jacobs and his cloud. It's time now to introduce our next participant in the great virtual tech conference. I'd like to now introduce Mr. Yaroslav Kornietz. Yaroslav, uh, welcome to virtual tech conference. Can you hear me OK? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I can hear you brilliant, just perfectly. Brilliant. So you're joining us from the comfort of your home sofa there, I see. Again, like, even though you work in Bristol with us in the office normally here, the great pandemics left you uh, sofa surfing at home with your laptop today. Uh, can you uh, tell us how, how have you found not making it into the office? How have you been able to keep up with work and keep up with professional services while you've been working from home? What challenges have you had? It looks like we are gradually increasing the distance of uh, every new presenter because Mike was just a mile away, um, around four miles away. Our next contributors would be further and further and further. Uh, generally answering your question, I had a year to get adjusted to working from home and I actually doubt I want to get back to the office and see those faces again, except of a dog, of course. Uh, but um, yeah, I'm surely just uh, kidding because uh, I want to get back to normal life like everyone else in the world and uh, get done with this pandemic. Uh, so uh, now I'm at least uh, seeing you guys and you're seeing me from uh, this SRT feed. And uh, yeah, I'm ready to present cool. well, my package. Yeah. Can you say a few words um, about the package that you've prepared? Obviously, you're product manager for Synergy Multiviewer as well as working in professional services. And I know you've been working with the development team on, on some enhancements. What can you tell us about what you're going to show us and then introduce it for us, please? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm mostly going to be talking about the GPU and the optimization in GPU pipeline and master pipeline of Synergy Multiviewer that we have introduced in a yet unreleased version of Multiviewer number 21. Uh, so basically, um, I'm demonstrating, I, I did some tests and research, and I'm demonstrating the results of those tests and making conclusions for you with some fancy infographics and some measurements to demonstrate just how efficient it is and uh, how much you want to uh, give it a test. Graphics chips started as fixed function graphics pipelines. Over the years, these graphics chips became increasingly programmable, which led NVIDIA to introduce the first graphic processing unit. The biggest constraint in using the GPUs for general purposes was that they required the use of graphics programming languages like OpenGL and CG to program the GPU. NVIDIA realized the potential of bringing this performance to the wider community and invested in modifying the GPU to make it fully programmable for scientific applications. Plus, it added support for high-level languages like C, C++, and Fortran. This led to the CUDA parallel computing platform for the GPU, 
Whilst the CPU is comprised of cores designed for sequential serial processing, the GPU is designed with a parallel architecture, consisting of more efficient yet smaller cores that easily handle multiple tasks in parallel. Simpler computing cores allow GPUs to pack many more cores into a chip than a general purpose CPU. Additionally, GPU architectures have specialized their memory architecture to support high-speed data streaming for image processing, important for broadcasting. NVIDIA GPUs contain one or more hardware-based decoder and encoder chips separate from the CUDA cores, which provides fully accelerated video decoding and encoding for several popular codecs. GPU hardware accelerator engines for video decoding, NVDAC, and video encoding. And VNG support faster than real time video processing, which makes them suitable for transcoding applications in addition to video playback. Synergy Air version 12 moved the compositing stage of the playout pipeline to optionally reside within the GPU, which had great benefits for customers that wanted to use our integrated branding system for adding graphics to the output. Or, we're using the very convenient and efficient NVIDIA NVENC H.264, H.265 encoding blocks. As people push the boundaries of the engine, the computation overhead of taking source material decoded within the CPU became a limiting factor. To reach the dream of 8K60 at 10 bit, we knew we needed to cure this. As a result, we created a way to connect the input stage of our media layer to the compositing stage without moving over the CPU at all. Of course, we went further with integrating our excellent GPU pipeline into Synergy Capture to both decode the input IP feeds and encode the output files, and Synergy Convert that uses GPU pipeline for media transcoding. GPU acceleration made our migration to cloud platforms smooth and seamless, and today our complete media production workflow can be run from the cloud. Synergy Multiviewer is not an exception. We've been using NVDAC to decode IP feeds as well as NVENC to encode the IP outputs ever since version 11. But recently we have made significant improvements in Multiviewer's GPU pipeline, and this is mainly what this video is going to be about. Bored by the lovely pleasures of year 2020, we challenged ourselves to build a high-density Multiviewer server able to decode and display an impressive 100 full HD feeds. For this, we used four NVIDIA Quadro RTX 4000 cards in a 64-core AMD Threadripper workstation. We used our own Synergy components to generate and send 100 of those feeds over a 10-gig link to this beast of a machine. What seemed to be odd, that even with the stunning performance of four RTX cards, the CPU load during this experiment turned out to be suspiciously high, while at the same time, the GPU's load seemed to be clearly slacking off. So, where could our resources utilization be improved? We are confident about our NVENC and NVDAC workflow, so we ruled this out as the potential bottleneck and focused our attention on another component key to multiviewer's performance, scaling. During the video frame processing required for scaling, the GPU would decode an uncompressed video frame of 4 megabytes of data for full HD. This data goes through a number of copying cycles from GPU to RAM, then to the CPU, just to be passed back to the CUDA cores of our GPU's main chip for processing. The main idea around improvements was about reducing the amount of these data copying operations and concentrating data processing in Multiviewer's master GPU pipeline. The results of my tasks on the next slides will illustrate just how brilliantly we coped with the task of optimization. The idea of my task was pretty simple. Load my test multiviewer servers with IP feeds to operate at hardware capacity using GPU decoding. Take the measurements, repeat the test with the yet unreleased multiviewer 21, compare the results. I chose a server with a 7-year-old Intel Xeon chip and an NVIDIA Quadro P2200 board almost matching the specs from our system recommendations. The P2200 card can handle up to 24 H.264 HD interlaced streams. I fed these 24 to the input of my Multiviewer 15, 
as multicast RTP over a 10 gig LAN, and I set all the streams to be decoded by a GPU. The CPU load in this test fluctuated between 45 and 50%, whilst the GPU was operating at 55% load, most of which is the video engine load attributed to NVDAC performance. I took a quick look at GPU Z readings to see that the main chip doing scaling was barely engaged. Next step, upgrading MultiViewer to a development version 21 that includes our changes to scaling, and voila, we see the CPU load significantly decreased. CPU now running at 25 to 30%, while the GPU is now pretty busy at 75% load. Having had another look at the GPU Z sensors, I saw that the general GPU load has increased, whilst video engine stays pretty much where it was in MultiViewer 15. The main chip's engagement is a clear evidence that our optimization is working. CPU load decreased by half and an extra 20% of GPU utilization sound good for starters. However, these results do not look as impressive on pure hardware. MultiViewer 15 scaling simply doesn't eat out as much CPU on this setup. What's going to happen if we try the same on virtual machines in the cloud? I chose an AWS G4 instance. Equipped with the Tesla T4 GPU and a 24-core Xeon Platinum CPU, they offer great performance for a relatively cost-effective price. Additionally, it literally takes a couple of minutes to get an EC2 instance ready for production. Check out our YouTube video from last summer, where we spent literally 10 minutes using Terraform Scripts Automation to launch 150 playout channels in the AWS environment. Similarly to my previous test, I started with MultiViewer 15 and fed it with 12 HD H.264 SRT streams delivered over public internet. MultiViewer 15 made the CPU work really hard at 94%, while my NVIDIA T4 was slacking off at 40% load. And even though decoding SRT streams eventually produces more CPU load, I've got to remind you I set my MultiViewer to use GPU to decode each of those input streams. An upgrade to MultiViewer 21 introduced quite a dramatic shift in performance. See for yourself. CPU utilization went down to just 42%, while GPU started working at 86%. Pretty much flipped the processing from CPU to GPU. This EC2 test kit is a good indication of how an entry-level GPU instance can be a great and cost-effective choice for your cloud monitoring. Running all your decoding for 12 streams on CPU only at a comfortable load would require at least a G4 4x large instance at £1.55 per hour. GPU offloaded decoding for the same number of streams is already an option for roughly half of that price with G4 2x large instances. And with the optimizations introduced, it leaves even more CPU headroom to neatly carry out other operations. If you don't care about headroom, you could potentially get away with a G4X large at even lower rates. Let's return now to our challenge of monitoring 100 HD channels in a single box. Remember, I was using an amazing 64 core AMD Threadripper with four NVIDIA RTX cards. Unlike the good old P2200, which only has one NVDAC chip, each of these cards offers two NVDAC chips, almost twice as many CUDA cores, and extra 3GB of memory, providing a level of density required to handle that many streams in a parallel. So, I streamed 100 5MAG HD H.264 feeds to the MultiViewer 15, letting each of the cards decode 25 streams. The CPU load was at 15%. While this seems low, this is definitely too much for a 64-core Threadripper with GPU offloading enabled. At the same time, the GPUs that were supposed to be busy with some heavy lifting were taking it easy, operating at 60%. The tiles on the multiviewer mosaic did not look smooth either, and the quality could be improved. Let's see whether we spot any improvement with the same setup running MultiViewer 21. The CPU load dropped down to 6%, while GPUs started working way harder at 80-90% to each. This resulted in MultiViewer pips having pristine quality and no jitter whatsoever. Challenge complete! This is not the end of it just yet. 
Having such an extraordinary machine at my disposal, I thought how much power this beast actually consumes, which made me think whether the optimization multiviewer had any impact on its energy efficiency. Having heard a lot of rumors about RTX GPUs being hungrier for power than the CPU, I decided to try and check whether the new multiviewer can buzz that myth. A 64-core AMD Threadripper chip seems to be a great rival for my multiple GPUs, so same challenge, but this time my focus will be on power consumption rather than CPU and GPU loads. I used a simple approach, with a watt per hour wall socket meter. I decided to skip filtering the noise, like the operating system, background processes, etc., and focused on measuring general consumption, assuming that 90% of power draw would be caused by CPU or GPU work anyway. I started with 50 HD feeds decoded in Multiviewer 21 by CPU. That is the number of streams it can handle without stuttering. Working at 65% load, the Threadripper scored 404 watts per hour. I then did the same with 50 HD streams fed to Multiviewer 21, this time with GPU decoding enabled. The meter reading showed 463 watts per hour and got me worried that these numbers won't be convincing enough as an argument for energy efficiency. However, I thought it would be unfair to not use the joint capacity of my four GPUs at its fullest, so I ran one last test with 100 feeds decoded by GPUs. And this is exactly where I can conclude that better GPU utilization introduced in Multiviewer 21 is a step to make our decoding energy efficient. 705 watts per hour was the meter reading. Look at per stream monthly costs. GPU decoding is clearly a way to save you some money. And don't forget that my Threadripper was only able to decode 50 streams without stuttering, compared to 100 streams decoded by 4 GPUs. Now imagine building a machine that can monitor 100 HD streams just with CPU decoding. That would probably require adding another Threadripper 3990X to your server. Not just it would result in doubled power consumption, but also cost you around £4,000 in purchase price. The cost of our Threadripper with four NVIDIA RTX GPUs set up is roughly £6,500. Given how low the CPU utilization was with GPU decoding enabled, it's safe to assume that one might get away with a 24-core chip for a similar server. I looked up a 24-core AMD chip of the same generation and thought Threadripper 3960X would be a fair comparison. The combined cost of four NVIDIA Quadro RTX 4000 boards and an AMD Threadripper 3960X would barely hit the price of a 3990X chip on its own and would still be able to monitor 100 HD feeds at a comfortable load. GPU decoding doesn't just offer a supreme density, higher cost efficiency, and better performance. It's also a way to reduce your carbon footprint by using energy efficient solutions. In summary, here's a combined graph of my test results between Multiviewer 15 and Multiviewer 21 on different hardware. As can be seen with the changes we have introduced, the CPU load has been reduced more than by a factor of two across all three test kits. At the same time, in each of these cases, we achieved an amazing improvement in GPU utilization, no matter if it's a new RTX 4000, older entry-level P2200, or cloud-based T4. Yes, now is a good time for broader conclusions on this entire experiment. GPUs are a good way to breathe some new life into your existing hardware. Even if your server has a 7-year-old CPU like mine in Test Kit 1, Adding a modern GPU like a brilliant RTX 4000 to your setup will cost around £800. Special thanks to crypto miners, it will help to keep your hardware delivering valuable functionality for another few years. GPU acceleration is an absolute necessity for cloud deployments, as this will drive higher density, better performance, and more cost efficiency. CPU-based computing simply can't offer you the kind of value for money that you get with GPU instances. Even with multiple GPUs working in a parallel for maximal density, you get less power consumption at a lower cost.
Multiviewer 21 is going to be even better and faster for your monitoring. Thanks for listening, and I hope to see you all on trade shows really soon. Well, having seen that, I think it's quite clear that Yaroslav now has upped the ante for colorful, shiny infographics so far in TechCon. Uh, I mean, it, it, that was a really great presentation with a lot of facts and details on. Uh, I think we'll be uploading these things as well post-event to YouTube so that people can go back and look over some of the details that are in there if they missed them first time round. I do have a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, so we're getting some feedback from our audience out there right now. We're really pleased to see that you're there and there in such great numbers. Uh, a few people have indicated there are some lip sync issues and some people have said that refreshing their browser fixes these lip sync issues. We're monitoring our outbound feed from our studio here. We've got it working right. Uh, something's going wrong somewhere out there in the world of the cloud streaming environment that's outside of our control or perhaps just uh, something going a bit strange inside browsers. It could be because we're running at 50 hertz and 50 FPS here. So if you're having lip sync issues, do try just hitting F5 in your browser first. Uh, alternatively, you can see if the YouTube stream, so if you go to the Synergy TV YouTube channel, works any better for you. If not, we're really sorry. Uh, we'll upload various elements of this uh, afterwards uh, where it will be in sync uh, and it's not live streaming these are the vagaries of being live yesterday when we checked it all it was working fine uh, but obviously we've got far higher load on the system here right now the second thing I just want to mention is it turns out that we forgot to actually turn on uh, allow external senders to our techcon at synergy.com email address. We'd obviously been testing it with our own email addresses. And as soon as we had some people trying to send in from externally, they were getting a bounce message. If you try and send your messages again now, they will get through. We've had some actually make it through this time after people kindly emailed uh, us on our personal addresses saying, uh, yeah, that's broken. So if you uh, have sent anything and got a bounce, you shouldn't get a bounce now. Please do send those through. So that's a couple of housekeeping points. But with that, let's uh, turn now to Mr. Pilbeam uh, to see if he's got some questions that he's got or some questions that may have come in from people now that we fixed our email system. Mr. Pilbeam. Yes, well, I've certainly seen questions come through. Um, not really relevant to this or too relevant to this part just yet, but um, one of the, the major questions that people want to ask with most of these uh, presentations is when can they use this thing? So one is, uh, when is Multiviewer 21 going to be released? Ah, see, now I am far too wise and experienced to commit myself to saying anything here. So in that case, I'm definitely throwing this over the fence for Yaroslav to answer himself. Yaroslav, are you still there? And can you answer that question for us? Uh, yeah, hopefully I'm still there. My SRT streams should be still uh, broadcasting. And uh, to answer that question, uh, we are expecting to ship, we are planning to ship Multiviewer 21 in the middle of quarter two, 2021. So, um, not cool, a fun. short and quick answer, but also not too long a time horizon on the delivery. Uh, and it, as usual, uh, it, there may be a while where we get things into release candidates and get this out into the hands of people before we uh, market a full golden relief. But yeah, and not very long until people can get that. Simon, if that answered your question, what can you hit us with next? Okay. Try harder. Oh, I will try much harder then. So I have a question here. It says, what about the alarms? According to the load we were seeing there, uh, they are CPU based. Do you plan to change that? Yeah, I mean, I remember that always one of the things whenever we talked about this internally was you know, decoding video on the GPU is easy, but the alarms where the system has to look at it is hard. Yaroslav, can you give us any insight on what the development team did to solve this? I, I think you touched on it in the presentation, but can you give us a bit more info? That's a brilliant question, and someone's definitely got a keen eye uh, because uh, in the current version of Multiviewer, the alarms were all CPU based. And uh, of course, we couldn't uh, leave that behind while making the optimizations I just introduced in my package. Uh, so we have moved all the alerts uh, to uh, GPU pipeline as well. So that goes through GPU ma master pipeline in Multiviewer. And kudos to Mr. Andre Kemka, who's done a prominent job uh delivering that yeah i mean uh, i know how to do a bit of programming myself and you know i'm aware of how i would have uh, made this move to a normal gpu pipeline for the video part but i i do not even know where andre began trying to make a bars detector in pure gpu so yeah uh there's there's some serious work gone into that but of course that's that's how you achieve 100 hd streams on a single cpu machine uh so yeah i mean that's really great news 
Mr. Pilbeam, what so, have you got? Come so on. I've got one sort of pre-prepared question that's going to lead us into our first genuine question from uh, over in the US. So the, the first part of this is, can we output multiple IP streams from the multiviewer? Oh, i batting that straight to you, Ashley. Multiple IP streams out from multiviewer. SRT and Unicast, I guess. So there's two answers to that. Can you answer them both? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's possible. So you can set up uh, a number of different IP outputs. Um, it uh, also includes RTP or um, uh, UDP multicast streams, as well as SRT. Moreover, you can uh, broadcast different layouts across uh, each of those uh, IP outputs, which makes your multiviewer even more flexible and uh, more uh, and better suitable to yeah, any I mean, workflow you can imagine. Yeah, that was one of the features you in version 15. So obviously getting 100 pips onto a single screen makes, as you saw in your presentation there, really small pips. But actually with multiviewer, there's nothing to say that you can't have that one multiviewer splitting that into... 25 times four uh, outputs all independently streaming, right? Cool. Absolutely. Right, Simon. So I said that was leading on to a, a second question. So the second question comes in from Tab over in the US. Um, I had a question regarding the delay of a signal that occurs when you take multiple RTP streams into the multiviewer software, say three or 16 signals, creating a single SRT stream output with the eight or 16 streams displayed in the single viewer output. OK, well, I can handle that one. So the delay is the answer is it depends, as all great answers are. Uh, so depending upon the input codec, that is what impacts the decoding latency. So it can vary in the core Synergy engine as to how long it takes and how much of a window it allocates for decoding. So if you send in an iframe based codec, uh, say IMX50 based or uh, the Daniel 2 codec or ABCI 100, the decoding window on that is much smaller because it only needs to leave one frame of uh, decoding window in that codec. But if you use long op codecs, that can stretch out to 250 milliseconds for H.264 to allow there to be the kind of constant bitrate transmission time. So it's affected by what the inbound uh, is. It's then affected by, with RTP input, whether there's uh, FEC type windows at play. Uh, if there's SRT inbound, it depends upon how much latency error correction has been put in. And of course, we then go into the compositing stage, which just takes a frame, really, to, for us to composite the multi-viewer output to send back out. Uh, then there'd be a small amount of encoding de delay in the IP output from multi-viewer, again, depending upon the uh, codec chosen. So we would emit back out in Daniel 2, uh, for example, much quicker than we would do if we were uh, streaming that back out as a constant bitrate H.264. So it could be a few hundred milliseconds of encoding delay, or up to a few hundred, depending upon output choices. And then finally, if you're SRT on the backhaul, actually each individual streaming client of that multiviewer can have a different amount of delay. So similar to what the question was before about multiple IP outs, one of the things I love about SRT is you can have multiple different receiving stations that all connect to the same IP stream, but depending upon how that SRT client has negotiated the link, that client may have decided to put a whole second for error correction in, whereas another client that's on a higher quality connection may have dropped that down to 40 milliseconds. So you could actually have the same IP stream, all the same codec, all the same uh, things otherwise being equal, but different delays depending upon how it's configured on that back end. And that actually leads me very neatly into our next contributor, because while we were actually on air going through Yaroslav's package there, we had to increase uh, our next presenter, our next, our next contributor, Polina, up to a second of SRT. So uh, as we bring in our contributors over their uh, webcams in from their, their home or their offices, obviously something's happening in uh, U Ukraine's home broadband marketplace that meant we had to stretch up from 250 milliseconds to a second, the error correction time, to stabilize Polina's uh, input, but that's again one of the things we love about SRT and one of the things about all of these circuits is that you can put in as much delay and as much correction time as needed to meet the requirement depending on, upon how far away they are and how the link quality is going. So given that, let's actually end our lovely multiviewer presentation and thanks very much for Yaroslav and the multiviewer team in working hard to get that to us and switch over to a further contributor all the way from Ukraine I'd like to introduce Miss Polina Fedorova. 
Paulina, are you still there? And are you able to talk to us over this uh, link now where we've had to increase the SRT error correction? Hey, brilliant. Yes, we, we still have access to you there. That's great. Well, uh, I mean, obviously, you work normally over in our Ukrainian office, where I know, again, the pandemic has been global in nature, and you're currently joining us from your home. You are head of support in your normal day job, uh, as one of the hats you wear. Can you tell us a little bit about how the support team in our Ukrainian office have adapted to the pandemic and how you've carried on being able to meet the support requirements for our customers during these difficult times? Well, uh, you know, we have been uh, practicing actually social distancing uh, for years. I mean, we are always in touch on messenger, on phone, uh, as our work includes uh, different shifts to cover 24-7 support, different load and even challenges that you should uh, get over only uh, with your team help. And I appreciate uh, my colleagues do care. Um, the COVID pandemic uh, has separated us from our workplaces and actually we do miss our uh, physical team gathering uh, during coffee and tea time, uh, our beer parties and um, our meetings and even our daily routine side by side. So. I hope we will be back. Well, yeah, I mean, I hope so too. I certainly miss, and it's been far too long since I've been out to our Ukraine office, and I always have a brilliant time meeting you guys over at the bowling alley and drinking a few local Ukrainian beers. So hopefully I'll be over there soon before too long to see you guys and to catch up with all the work you've been up to. Uh, your package today, uh, changing pace a little bit from visual elements, you're uh, working and you've been working with Alex Kalemba on a revamp of Traffic Gateway. Can you give us a little bit of a detail of what your package is that you're going to be running for us and introduce it for us, please? Sure. Today I would like to present a brand new Synergy Traffic Gateway generation. It significantly extends custom scenarios and workflows by incorporating a flexible custom business logic on every step of processing. Um, I should say that Synergy Traffic Gateway is not only uh, the user-friendly and self-contained product, but also um, it can be used as a part of uh, enterprise-level uh, orchestration system. So let's explore its capabilities uh, on the practical example we specifically prepared for this demo. I hope you will enjoy the presentation. The agenda of the current presentation is the following. At first, we will quickly review the existing traffic gateway limitations and bottlenecks. Then, we will have high-level overview of the changes made to the new traffic gateway and what functionality it has. Next is the description of the typical workflow schema implemented by new traffic gateway. To show you the practical example of the new traffic gateway capabilities, we will have short demonstration of the sample workflow that involves additional business logic execution steps. Then we will go through the sample workflow and how it was implemented to get better understanding on what is possible with the new traffic gateway. And at the end of the presentation, we will compare out-of-the-box capabilities of traffic gateway versus the enterprise-level complex installation scenarios. Unfortunately, Alex Kilimbet was not able to take an active part in the presentation itself, but added a few valuable corrections and highlights. You will definitely notice them. The old traffic gateway generation had a number of limitations. Despite the fact Synergy tried to support the most common industry backsell format, we had to polish and adapt parser for each vendor due to small changes in implementation and workflow. 
other option was a simple universal synergy CSV input format that is widely used but requires translation from the customer format. In most cases, customers control few channels at once, which requires different settings, content, and graphics. The generated playlists are put to the same folder that also requires the post-processing actions. Often customers need some business rules and extra logic that must be incorporated into the playlist generation that was not easy to do in the old fixed workflow. At the same time, old traffic gateway was simple enough to set up and maintain. Therefore, we have built a more flexible, extendable, but still simple brand new Synergy traffic gateway. It runs natively on Windows, Linux, and also fully supports containerization, for example, with Docker. The configuration file is stored in a JSON format for ease of use and automatic modifications. The same configuration file can be accessed via REST API. Synergy Traffic Gateway has built-in machine-readable logging and telemetry enabled on all stages of processing, leaving no dark places to hide. Categories and message priorities allow easy filtering and automatic processing of the generated logs. Synergy Traffic Gateway can run in a fully automated mode being triggered by watch folders and store the generated playlist in the specified folders. It also can trigger processing of the playlist as a response to the REST API call. Uh, no. <laughs> the information about the corresponding task status can also be requested via REST API. Traffic Gateway was re-architectured to expose its functionality as reusable modules that simplifies custom business logic implementation where it's required. For example, SMPTE BXF, Synergy Media Asset Management, and Synergy MCR modules provide a list of helpful commands to manipulate corresponding business entities. Creating a new playlist and filling it with programs, blocks, and items have never been easier task to do. These commands make creation of PowerShell business logic scripts an easy and less error-prone task. The last but not the least, Traffic Gateway natively supports multiple channels with different settings and workflows. The number of stages of the playlist processing may be customized. Moreover, each stage may be enclosed by pre- and post-processing events. As a common format, the Synergy Air playlist is used on all stages that actually unifies the data transferring from start to finish. The general workflow can be triggered by sending a new task for processing via REST API or via configured watch folders. Synergy Traffic Gateway supports multiple simultaneous tasks execution. It also provides reports over the queue status and currently active tasks via REST API. The final result of the task processing can be obtained also via REST API or stored as a playlist in the specified folder. So, let's see the internal processing in more detail. When the task is picked up from the queue, its processing starts from the input handler. It's responsible for the initial transformation of the input playlist format 
into Synergy Air Playlist 1 that is used as native internal pipeline format. The input handler takes SMPT EBXF, Synergy CSV or R the custom format and performs the initial conversion. In case the playlist contains all the required information, the processing can end immediately. However, usually additional business logic is involved. For example, to fill in the commercial blocks with paid ads that are provided by external system or to resolve the required media locations from different sources like Synergy Archive, Amazon S3, local library. And the final step is storing the complete playlist on the network share or, for example, load into Synergy Air directly via API. Each processing step is independent from others. The data is passed from one stage to the next one, preserving the changes that are made. This allows to repeat the corresponding step in case of processing errors in future versions of Traffic Gateway. The processing pipeline is flexible and can include any number of processing steps. Every step also has an option to execute the PowerShell script before or after processing, allowing further extension and custom logic to be executed. The final processing step usually stores uh, the generated playlist into the specified network shares. Alternatively, the processing result for the corresponding task can be retrieved via Traffic Gateway REST API. Let's start our demo from creating a playlist draft in Synergy Air Playlist Editor. This is the playlist template that contains programs separated to blocks that contain dummy items. Then the corresponding playlist will be stored in the folder monitored by Synergy Traffic to start the processing. During the processing, Empty commercial blocks will be filled according to the our pre-programmed business logic. Then the real media items will be picked up from the Synergy Archive and Amazon S3 buckets. Afterwards, the final playlist will be generated and automatically loaded into Synergy Air. We will start from Synergy Playlist Editor. Let's assume we have created a basic playlist structure based on a planned events list for the next day. We know what programs are scheduled for the broadcast at specified times and general program structure, I mean logical blocks of the broadcast. So we will compose our playlist from the dummy items with the default duration then specify the exact start times for the specific items and then add empty ads blocks to the schedule. They will be taken care of later. The only important bits in the playlist we created are traffic IDs we assigned to each of the dummy item. These IDs will be used by Traffic Gateway when looking for the real media items to be added to the list instead. Two additional pieces of the puzzle for the demo. Synergy Traffic Gateway currently started as console application to show visually its playlist processing actions. And Synergy Air Broadcast Channel waiting for our playlist to arrive and be automatically appended to the running schedule. As you can see, we have only a few placeholder clips to have some content running while the next portion is about to arrive. To initiate the playlist processing, we just save our playlist template into the folder monitored by Traffic Gateway. As you can see now, Traffic Gateway already picked up the playlist and is doing some magical steps to transform it from dummy list of IDs into something ready for the broadcast. In a few seconds, 
it will finish and we will have our media automatically added to the running channel playlist. And finally, the playlist is here. As you can see now, every item is no longer a dummy one, but have some media instead. Ads blocks are filled in with actual advertisements. Items metadata are also updated. Item names, description, duration and other valuable info is filled in automatically. Programs, blocks and actual item start times are also preserved. The playlist is ready for next broadcast day without any operator assistant, but keeping an eye on your channel is always a good idea. Let's review what happened in the background in more detail to understand how Synergy Traffic Gateway performed its task. Here is the list of for flow steps. We start from the playlist template that contains programs separated to blocks that contain dummy items. Each item has its specific traffic ID. The commercial blocks are empty as they are expected to be filled automatically at later stages. The playlist is stored into monitored watch folder. The Traffic Gateway watch folder picks up a new file, checks the channel that this playlist belongs to and puts a new task into a queue. Another option here could be adding a new task via Traffic Gateway REST API by some third-party system. According to the channel configuration, the first step is filling in uh, the empty commercial blocks with actual advertisement clips. Usually this requires the external business logic, for example, REST service that receives commercial blocks ID planet duration and date time of the planet playback. The service provides a list of actual advertisement clips that are inserted in the corresponding blocks. As a result of this step execution, the empty ads blocks are filled in with the IDs of the required items to be broadcast. Now the playlist is prepared to be filled in by real media based on the specified material traffic IDs. The first configured provider is Synergy Archive. For each item in the playlist, Synergy Archive database is scanned for the traffic ID. When corresponding clip or sequence is found, its metadata is inserted into the playlist replacing the dummy item with real media, including updated item duration. The process is repeated for each dummy item in the playlist. Now the playlist is prepared and filled in with references to the real media items in the Synergy archive. Dummy items have been replaced with the actual metadata. For the purpose of this demo, we left few items in the playlist unresolved by Synergy Archive. So these items will be resolved by media from dedicated Amazon S3 buckets. We have prepared th three Amazon S3 buckets with additional media that will be used in the playlist. As you can see, the missing media is replaced with links to the object storage and playlist is ready to be generated. Each of the three pre-configured Amazon S3 buckets are scanned for the media. The process continues until the media is resolved or no more media source are left. When the playlist is ready and filled in with the links to the real media, it's stored in the other watch folder monitored by Synergy Air Control. Once Synergy Air Control detects a new playlist availability 
and verifies its validity, it's automatically appended to the active playlist. While Traffic Gateway can handle most of the common requirements, in some cases integration with the third-party systems is required. When the workflow becomes complex and involves other services, the probability of unexpected execution results greatly increases. In such case, for example, for enterprise-level orchestration and workflow control, Apache Airflow can be used. It comes with a lot of handy features like graphical UI that helps to understand the workflow execution history, advanced logging to trace every single detail of the process, automatic step repetition and failure control, and many more. Apache Airflow also gives you more control on the workflow graph where you can build a simple, advanced, and even insane graphs. Hopefully you will never need something like this in your regular broadcast production. When systems like Apache Airflow are in use, existing traffic gateway modules can be integrated into the corresponding third-party system with minimal adaptations required. Our wonderful professional services team is ready to help you to get up and running as soon as possible. So, what may help you deciding which approach to take? Standalone traffic or enterprise orchestration system with traffic modules? As an approximation, you can consider assessing the following requirements. First one, the installation size. Traffic Gateway is most suitable for the small and medium-sized installations. When the number of broadcast channels grow, there is a limit when operator can control and maintain them within the simple system. Apache Airflow can help you keeping a large number of channels under your control without enormous efforts. Second one, processing scale. Consider the number of playlist processing transactions during working hours. More tasks to be completed, more chances something goes wrong and will require operator assistance. The next one, business logic. In case your workflow involves several third-party systems and complex decision-making during the playlist creation, I would say it worth considering Apache Airflow path to keep an eye on all processing steps on the go. Complexity. You should define your goals. Either you are under time pressure and should be running as soon as possible, or you are ready to spend some of your precious time planning and implementing large system with custom integrations that should work flawlessly under heavy load. Redundancy. Traffic Gateway will happily get you through most of the workflows and some basic failures. Although in case you expect the system to self-diagnosis and self-healing when possible, consider designing your system with the help of our professional services team and Apache Airflow as a background. I hope having seen this presentation, you now have enough information to plan your next steps with Synergy products and specifically with Synergy Traffic Gateway for your next small or large scale projects. In case of any doubt, please feel free to contact our professional services team to help you with reaching your valuable goals in a most efficient way. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and interest.
Well, thanks, Polina. Uh, I mean, it's really great to hear that presentation and all about the new features inside Traffic Gateway there. I'd also like to take a moment just to acknowledge the fact that more than half of our presenters are speaking in English, but uh, those aren't their native languages. So just a, a little bit of extra credit for people that not only have recorded their presentations, as we just saw there from Polina, in not their native language, uh, also taking live questions on a live video stream in, in English is much appreciated. And on that topic, Mr. Pilbeam, voice from the sky, uh, do we have anything that we want to put to Polina after that? Yes, we do. Um, I've got uh, the bog standard question, I suppose, with each one of these is when do you expect this new version to be released? Yeah, we'll start a, with that one. A good question, and I will immediately throw that one straight back over to Polina. So, Polina, just to repeat the question, what can you tell us about when this might be available to release or use? Thank you for the question. So general public release of Synergy Traffic Gateway new generation is planned for uh, Q3 2021. But nevertheless, uh, we already have at least two production installations. First one is running Vanilla Traffic Gateway with few custom uh, scripts to represent the uh, business logic. And the second one is large-scale installation orchestrated by Apache Airflow that uses Synergy Traffic Gateway modules for cool. processing. Okay. I mean, it's, it's often the case uh, that a number of things are born out of project-related work and we then have to kind of follow along behind to productize. So it's worth remembering that uh, you know, availability of software, we love to get things into a full released mainstream product version, but actually uh, sometimes things are deployed almost in pro project where for specific requirements ahead of then. So it, it's kind of driven by customer requirements. Mr. Pilbeam, uh, follow-ups? Yes, so um, I've got one question here that says, is it possible for Traffic Gateway to generate a list of all missing li uh, items that are not available on Synergy Archive? Would this list be a CSV per channel? Oh, okay. So, I mean, this is one of the big things about the extensibility of Traffic Gateway. Uh, it, it can be anything you want. So the original Traffic Gateway used to produce missing lists. Now, I don't know if Polina remembers off the top of her head what the missing list format was in old Traffic Gateway, but the, the new Traffic Gateway can definitely uh, output missing lists in any format. And actually, it's often on a production... Uh, it's different, different by, uh, by deployment because it's so configurable you can choose to have a customized format in anything you can imagine uh, with the PowerShell extensibility. Polina, do you remember what, what we already even had? Was it CSV in the missing list before or was it just, it was just continuous lists, I think? So Synergy Traffic Gateway currently supports a SMPTE backsev, then Synergy CSV uh, and Synergy app release format by default, but uh, the list of formats can be easily extended uh, by custom PowerShell scripts that contain actually the playlist transformation uh, logic uh, from uh, any required format to Synergy Air playlist one. Uh, so you can use um, SMPTE backself processing script and as an example of uh, custom logic implemented Okay, so we can, we can take multiple different input formats effectively and we can extend them relatively easily and then with the extendable hooks in PowerShell or the different modules that are there missing media lists are, I mean I know that one of the projects we we actually wrote into a DynamoDB database in AWS so that it wasn't a specific missing media list as workflows become more enhanced sometimes there's no concept of an individual list from a particular run there's just a, a continuously updated list of uh, what what is and what isn't available in databases so and the answer is yes we can absolutely meet a csv is easy to do uh, and we have we've we've got experience of very quickly and easily implementing even much more complicated missing media tables inside databases so that probably answers that question uh, and and one that you didn't ask simon there uh, anything else that you want to throw in at us um, certainly, I've got one last question in this section at the moment. Um, how much time does it take to set up and configure new traffic gateway to cover some custom workflows? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, uh, and I can answer that one as well because I'm quite often dragged into these kind of things through the professional services arm. 
and there's kind of two parts to the answer. So uh, there is, of course, the time it takes to write bespoke scripts or bespoke business logic parts into PowerShell, but we post quite a lot of things on GitHub that show examples and references for that already. And with the modules that we have in Traffic Gateways, you saw in the presentation, to create a playlist, it's as easy as typing new MCR list. These extensions can be really just a matter of hours to, to create customized logic. What we often find is that the uh, time it takes to uh, work with a customer to understand what they really want can take just as long. So really it can vary from just a half day engagement working with a customer to define a statement of work and implement some simple logic through to multiple days and multiple weeks in uh, detailing complex statements of work with complex business requirements and then implementing. So, you know, it, it can vary. Uh, did that answer the question enough for you, Simon? It did. It was perfect. Uh, I've got a follow-up question, which is Ooh. sort of related to that as well, is can yeah. people install and configure the traffic gateway themselves without Synergy Professional Services? Yes, they absolutely can. So it remains a key strategic idea that we do want people to be able to do this kind of installation and work themselves. So uh, it may well be, for example, with something like Traffic Gateway, this new version where there's JSON files and more of a DevOps approach, it might be the, perhaps the first time a customer encounters this, they would want to work with us. But we would absolutely hope and dream and want that we could have customers that would then be able to do any subsequent deployments themselves, script things and enhance things themselves. Uh, of course, it will be documented on Synergy Open as we document already things related to Traffic Gateway or to our CSV format. So if someone was really quite used to doing systems integration work, we would be not doing our jobs correctly if we didn't have enough information on open, in kind of YouTube videos and blog posts for people to actually work without engaging us at all if they have that skill set on staff. But if you don't, you know, that's what we're here for. It can be cheaper effectively to pay us to do that part for you because, of course, you know, I can do something in four hours that would take someone else a couple of days of learning first. So uh, it, it, it remains on that spectrum and, and meets that requirement of customer control, where we definitely are not taking any steps to, to say this must be done by us, uh, just that instead it can be done by us. Uh, does that get you? That gets me. Thank yeah. you. That, that takes us to the end of all the questions I've got here. Oh, brilliant. Okay, well, thank you very much, Polina, for joining us. We'll release you now to go about your day. And thank you for putting the effort in there. And thank Alex for working on producing that for, for us with some of his little... Uh, graffiti acts inside the PowerPoint presentation. So during that package, I actually took the opportunity to get up and have a little wander around our studio here and see some of the things that are coming in. Uh, and again, just to kind of prove to you this is really live, uh, we have a prop. Uh, I have a copy of today's newspaper, just a proof of life video here, so you can see this is really happening. And I can also fulfill a dream that's come in from dear Mr. McCund, who uh, said that he's really joining TechCon, hoping for Simon to drop a joke for us, uh, as used to be traditional at the physical technical conferences. So putting you on the spot, Simon, can you make me laugh? I'm not sure that I can actually make you laugh, but I can certainly tell a joke. Um, so, I mean, we've all suffered under um, the COVID restrictions, and I, I got really fed up, and I thought, I really fancy doing something different. So I wanted to get a tattoo, but I wasn't sure which one I wanted. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll go down to the temporary tattoo shop and get a temporary tattoo. And off I went. I went. I went down there, chose one. They put this temporary tattoo on me. Absolutely fine. They said, just wash it off. It'll be great. So I slept on it, got up the next morning, had a look at it and thought, you know what, it's not bad, but it's not really what I want. And I tried to wash it off and it wouldn't come off. I got really annoyed. So I went marching down to the shop and guess what? Shop wasn't there anymore. Ah, uh, marvellous. Like all the best jokes as well, it should need no explaining, but did have to actually be explained to me because I didn't get it the first time. So <laughs> hopefully that fulfills So would you like me to explain it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the explanation is it was a temporary tattoo shop, not a <laughs> shop that did temporary tattoos. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I, I did feel suitably stupid when I said, but I don't get that joke. And uh, then the guys pointed out that it was a temporary tattoo shop. Well, at least everybody now knows what they're missing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, fortunately, unless we have major technical difficulties, none of you should have to suffer with any further of these jokes. 
so given that, it's now time to move on uh, and move from Ukraine and swing our attentions to Munich. So I, I'm going to introduce now our next contributor. Uh, his name is Michael Zolosuski, uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome into our virtual studio now, Michael, our Head of Development, joining us from our Munich office. Michael, can you hear me? Uh, are, are you okay over there? Yeah, yes, yes, I can hear I you. I can hear well. you, yep, yeah, the, the technology is working. We did find that because we've actually Very got good. quite a number of staff watching the technical conference, and Michael is in the, the Munich office, which has got you know, individual offices, uh, Michael's stream was suffering a bit more now. I think a lot more internet traffic was going through the office. Uh, so uh, hello to everyone that's watching in the Munich office. Uh, I, I miss you guys and look forward to drinking a beer with you in Munich again one day. Uh, so, Michael, you've been working on uh, more of our future-facing things. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've been working with the team and introduce what it is that you've got uh, in the package you've prepared that we've got coming up? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, hello, everybody. And I'm very happy to meet you in the virtual conference here today, after a long time, actually. Um, well, if you watch the Synergy webinar a few weeks ago, you have learned how you can build a kind of the remote workflow with Synergy products uh, using the third party tools like uh, TeamViewer or AnyDesk, some more complex solutions like Teradici, Guacamole, or even directly in the cloud, Amazon, Azure, Azure whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, today, I would like to take a deeper look at this exciting topic actually and talk more specifically what we are doing now on the software level to give you a chance to use a full range of the modern technologies so that you can get out of the office and finally start working from the re remote locations. Um, well, I'll show you in action what has been done already and already shipped, what we are working on now and even slightly share with you what will be delivered in the near future. I would, I would start my presentation with two questions. We are going to talk about remote production. Uh, the first question I would like to ask is actually why? Why we want to go remote? Why we, do we actually need the remote production at all? And first of all, it's not just because of pandemic. Uh, the IT technologies are being developed incredibly fast during the last few years and the internet speed is increasing also very fast. All this is motivating us to start using these advantages of the technologies and to be able to work from the remote facilities with the same high efficient. But of course, uh, the Corona times also declared special demands for uh, the remote solutions. And nowadays it's a it's very important to be able to build the remote production workflow. So it's a kind of answer why. The next question is how. How we are doing that? Which kind of technologies we could use to build the remote production, to build the remote uh, workflow? That's interesting that first, what the most of customers think of when saying remote work are old good web applications which remain a favorite way to work from the remote work working places. These are cross-platform solutions which are easy to deploy and can be run on almost any OS and hardware, including mobile devices. And this is great. However, there are some native limitations which sometimes make the real-time video editing a bit tricky. So therefore, a part of web-based applications, there are also some other ways. And the next possible approach is the microservices and server-based solutions. It means we can still be not purely web-based, but we can work with a server, uh, with talking to the microservices installed on, around the server or uh, the main facility. But we are able to work from the remote places via internet connection, uh, operating through the services and being able to make the most important operations and most important work, which also covers uh, a lot of our daily uh, needs. And the most interesting 
is a so-called hybrid solutions. It uh, might be a combination of all existing technologies which give the best and the most efficient solution for the remote work. This is most interesting area for research and Synergy is working hard in the approach as well. Today I'm going to show you the first exciting prototypes of the application using this approach and you will be the first who will see it ever. So actually Synergy is trying to use the best combination of all these technologies. I've split my demo to three virtual time frames. I've called them today, uh, what is available now, tomorrow, what comes in the course of the next days, and soon, what is currently being developed and coming soon. Now we are going to talk about today. It will be a brand new and completely reworked version of the Synergy product called Workspace. Uh, this is a web-based front-end for the remote access to your MAM, to your archive. This is now a pure HTML5 web application, which doesn't require any installation and can be run directly in the browser. This version has been recently released and published on the Synergy portal, so it's completely ready to use and you can download and start using virtually now. Let's start now the workspace application. So you can see the login page and now we need to give some credentials to log in to our archive remotely. Good. Now you can see the new workspace interface. This is now HTML5 based, it's cross platformed and can be run on any OS or any devices. I'm now connected to the production system installed in Bristol in the UK while I'm sitting in Munich. So it's about 2000 km away from my office. A nice long distance, right? But I'm able to access the whole archive in Bristol now. At the left hand panel, you can see all my media in archive exactly like I can see it in the local desktop application. So we can go through the folders, looking for the clips. So I can also see the row panels here displaying my sub clips and I can have an access to all their metadata. So if I select the clip, I can see the metadata on the right side. So the tool gives the option not just for browsing, but also for the initial asset editing. So I can edit some description, I can save them back to the archive here. But the really big advantage is that you can not just work with the clip metadata here, but you have the full access to your media as well. You can open the clip in the clip viewer and play it back and with a good quality. Like here, we can go there, press. You can also find the nice scene directly in the clip, here in the clip viewer. You can also make mark in and mark out points for your scene. See here. And you can even create the subclip directly from here. We get it? We can open this in the clip viewer to, to play it back check the quality, check uh, whether it's exactly what we wanted to get. And we can also add some metadata here. Like that. It's now saved, back to the archive. This is all quite useful, but I want to show you exciting new feature of the new workspace. This is an integration with the Synergy Convert and so-called job folders for the automatic server-based processing. I'm especially happy to introduce a brand new function here, the ability to publish your clips in the social networks. In this case, I'll show you how it works with YouTube publishing. So imagine, uh, we have some edited clips and uh, now we want to publish them to the YouTube channel. So I have some nice shots here in my private folder go quickly here so i can see the nice yeah nice shots from a snowboarding session which i wanted to publish so let's select the clip 
and uh, I may want to find some part of this clip which I want to publish so I can create the sub clip directly here. So let's create a new one. And now I want to publish it on YouTube. This is super easy. I should just select the command sent to job folder here. And now I can see the job submitting form where I can choose the job for publishing to the YouTube now here. Yeah, right. I can also add some additional data for this processing, like a job name, uh, which will be my YouTube clip name, as well as some comments or additional data, which will be also going to the YouTube and we can see this as a uh, YouTube comments, clip comments. I have just to press the send button now. On the right side, we can see the processing queue and we can see that our job is queued now for processing. And this process will be performed on the server side. So nothing will disturb us and we can meantime continue our work here, looking through the media, going to other clips, and doing what we need to do. We can also anytime check the status of our publishing process, uh, just looking at the corresponding job folder. And we can see our job is complete now. Actually, it means we can find our clip in the YouTube channel. Magic. Let's open YouTube now and check if we have our clip there already. Yes, our clip is really there. We can open it and play it. Look at here. The clip name, King of Skiing, is really here, and as well as our uh, comments. The best moment of snowboarding. It's exactly what we have given as a clip comment, and now we have it in the YouTube as well. So it worked, and worked perfectly. And everything we have managed, sitting in the good distance from my server, my uh, main facility, and everything was done directly in the, our web-based application. It was a good example how easy you can perform the media editing, manage your metadata, and even publish your clip to YouTube. Uh, note that the same approach can be used for other Synergy Convert functions as well, so you can initiate any transcoding task or even export the media from archive to another location, and so on. All these directly from your remote office by using the new version of Synergy Workspace. And again, this version is released now. It's available on the portal. You can start using this today. Now we are moving to the tomorrow part. Just now we are preparing for release of the new major version of Synergy Capture. What's new in this release? Actually, there is a list of new features, but in the scope of subjects, the most interesting would be the fact that Synergy Capture is now completely cloud-ready. What does it mean? Remember, Synergy Capture is a server-client solution, and always was like this. It means that server part, the capture engines, can be installed on the server, while you can control them remotely from the client control application. But you had to install all parts in the same facility and connect them with the Ethernet or VPN or somehow. Um, now it natively supports the configuration when the server part is installed in the studio, data center, or in the cloud, while you can control it from the remote office via pure internet connection. It still remains a Windows application, but it can be removed from the server infrastructure. Let's see how it works. Let's start the Capture Manager on our local machine here. You may remember that Capture Manager used to be installed on the same server with the Capture Engines. Now it's not the case. And you can immediately see the difference. It requests the server name to connect to. Here. I'm going to connect to the same studio in Bristol, so the distance remains the same, about 2000 kilometers. Now I can see all my engines so that I can manage them directly from here. Create, start and configure remotely. Here. So we can check the configuration, we can start stop the service, so we have a full control now. And uh, it I can also see the real-time preview feeds coming back uh, to Munich via SRT stream. 
here I can switch to the real time preview and I will be seeing the real time streaming from the remote server back to my local machine. But this was just a capture manager. The most interesting, of course, would be to run the capture control to see how can we really control these engines in Bristol from here. So let's run the capture control now and try to add this server for control. You see, I can reach the both engines installed on the remote server in Bristol. I can see the preview, I can see everything exactly like it would be here in the local infrastructure. As I mentioned, I can see the preview, I can see the dashboard with all important parameters from the server, and of course I can start stop recording directly from the local machine here from Munich. All what I have to do is just to select the engine, select the template, which I have already here, and press the record button. Now my session has been started, I can see the recording is running. Uh, I can also see all my parameters as usual, so in the dashboard I can see how my session is going actually. So and of course I can stop the session again. So I can do everything from my location in Unique, controlling the capture engines installed in Bristol in the long distance from here. So as you can see, all my daily ingest operations can be now performed from the significant distance and just via internet connection. And I can also add that the new Synergy Capture version uh, is being prepared right now for release and should be available for uh, download within the next week or two. So watch the space. Now I have reached actually the most interesting and exciting part of my presentation today and I will start with a known product it will be Synergy Air but I will show you the brand new control panel in this case it will be the web-based control panel which would work remotely with your Air engine so let's start now the Synergy Air web application it will be running of course directly in the browser we can of course use a full screen mode so it will be more like the application the desktop application but it's still running inside the desktop uh, inside the browser and this is actually the web application the completely pure html5 so we can connect to the engine and you can see very similar picture as you normally see in the thick client in the windows control panel you can even log in to the, to the archive and you will see the browser exactly the same as normally you can see in a, a desktop application in the fact it means you can operate your playout your, your active playout engine in the same way how you are doing this now with a control Synergy control application uh, in the local environment so this is a playlist you have an access to the active playlist you can uh, preview the items you can play it back here and see um, yeah what's planned what is that you can also uh, select the item for playout you can queue items as a normal way as usually you do with the uh, uh, synergy control application the windows application thick client and you can even start queued item directly from here you see now I, i've start my next playout item with graphics with everything and it's going to the air but i'm operating really from remote location so it's not like we uh, do this um, uh, locally it's now over the internet connection so everything what I can see here is completely internet connected you can also browse for the clips in the archive so you have the archive browser here 
the same way as uh, in the Windows control application. So you can browse for clips, you can take this directly from here and insert into the playlist here. So actually, the most of the daily operations are available for you in the new, brand new web application, the web control. This is still being developed, so it's not available now and won't be available in next few weeks. But uh, the plan is definitely to have it uh, in this year and we will be working very hard to make it ready to deliver it to you. We have reached now the final part of my presentation and I'll introduce you the new application which we are working on and this is a so-called hybrid solution. It uses all technologies which we talked about and it will be very interesting to see because you are the very first audience who can see this ever. And I would like to ask Luis to join me. Hello, Luis. Hey, Michael. Okay. And uh, now let's start this new application. Okay. And you see, it looks very similar to the existing desktop application seen in desktop. It has actually the very similar components like the Explorer on the left hand. Uh, we have the Clip Viewer and even timeline. So it's really, really like a desktop application, but it's not the real desktop application. And now we would connect to the MAM system. So that, that looks a lot like the system that we've actually got in Bristol. So I'm talking to you right now and you're sharing your screen with me from Germany, but you're connecting to Bristol, right? Exactly, Louis. It's the same system and you can see the uh, all same uh, media assets uh, we already seen previously. So we still connected from Munich to Bristol, but I'm working from, from, from Munich uh, desktop machine. Okay, yeah. And so, but you logged in inside the app here. So you don't need to be on a machine that's actually in our company active directory to sign into this app, right? Not at all. No, this is very, very like a web application. So it's very easy to deploy. It actually doesn't require any installation process. Uh, it works via the internet connection, doesn't require any uh, domain controller or VPN connection. It can be really purely internet connection to the remote facility, to the remote server, but uh, it looks like really desktop application. Yeah, so I could actually install this on my home PC, my personal PC, if I chose, and I don't need to have a VPN or any LAN connection or anything. It would just it would just work on that PC. No, not at all. You don't need anything, and even more, you can run it on your Windows PC and on your Mac PC. On my so this is Synergy making a Mac application for the first time. It's a cross-platform. It's exactly the, our know-how for now. So the hybrid technologies uh, give us a very good chance to build the applications you can easily deploy on your Windows and your Mac machine. You don't need VPN, you don't need uh, any kind of domain, just run and use. Okay, well, I mean, that's obviously really helpful given all the homeworking people have been doing at the minute. I, I'm, I'm intrigued. Show me what comes next in here. What else can we actually do with this right now? We can go through the uh, our objects or our, our, our tree. Uh, we can open the same folders. Everything it's, it looks really similar like a desktop application. So we can uh, open our clips uh, in our clip viewer. So you can see this uh, normal preview way how we work uh, in desktop application. You can play it back. You can uh, go through the clip. Just the usual daily uh, work. And so when you've loaded that up in there, you know, this is obviously going to work on outside of the network and cross platform. Is that a kind of proxy type workflow still then? Is that streaming video from the central servers onto this app? Yes, exactly. If you talk about more, a little bit more technical stuff, it's exactly like you said. All the video streaming coming from the server, because it's a server-oriented, the server-based rendering stuff, which is streaming through the internet, and it's proxied locally on the local machine. And therefore, it gives you a very efficient way to play back your clips. Okay, so all of the content at high res can stay safely locked up inside a broadcaster's site and the server can see the domain and can see the network shares, but effectively that produces a version that's ready to stream out and be used by these client front ends installed on my PC at home. Exactly. This is exactly the idea behind of this. And it gives you the, the efficient, and you use efficiently your internet connection. It's exactly why we can do that. 
cool. I mean, it still looks like a, a professional Synergy app. It's got mark in, mark out all the time codes and everything. And there's also this incredibly suspicious part labeled timeline at the bottom. Can you tell me about that bit? Yeah, we'll, we'll see this in a second. So let's go now my private folder. And it's exactly what I'm going to show you, how we can work with sequences, not just with clips. So you see, I'm open now the sequence, my production, which is, uh, so this is uh, my snowboarding session, but already edited. So as you can see, it's not just a simple clips. It's a really effects inside, some graphics inside. We can play it back and all all here from the Bristol back to my machine and I can play it back in real time. Cool, so we can see the timeline representation. So I can literally see this is composed of two video tracks and effects and we can see uh, I can see you scrubbing around and that's one of our picture in picture effects there that you're able to kind of slide backwards and forwards on as if this was actually rendering it local but it's all been rendered server side and shipped down so it's invisible to me. And just works right yeah absolutely and you can really you can't you can't notice uh, any any different because you're just working because in the usual way you can play back you can uh, just go through the sequence you can see everything in the clip viewer so it looks like the normal desktop operation and and it's a back-end process that's then taking care of all the heavy lifting and all of the the compositing effectively letting me not worry about having uh, I, don't, I don't have access to these clips on this pc so that's just some kind of new rendering service you've made right yeah exactly Exactly. You, you don't need to, to have an access, you don't need to install the very powerful graphics card or whatever, because everything is being performed server-side. You just get the uh, final stream with everything what's what you use for your production, and you can see already the result without um, yeah, this very special, powerful hardware or the uh, direct access to the files, to the media. It's all somewhere yeah, this away from here. So, I mean, I could literally be looking like a hipster with my MacBook in some internet cafe, just accessing all of this over Wi-Fi then. Yeah, why not? <laughs> you, you can easily well, do this. Yeah. I'm really excited. And so and so this is cross platform. Yes, yeah, this is um, Electron, which exactly the technologies gives it this ability to wrap your application into the cross platform, easy to deploy and easy to run application. Cool. So and, and what makes it hybrid is that it's kind of cloud connected. It's using HTML5 inside the rendering part, but at yeah. the same time we can still run full C++ apps like the Cinecoder libraries. All of that can still run on the machine. So it really is like a real hybrid mix up of the best parts of all of it, right? Yeah, right. So you can you can choose what's better for you. If you have, for example, some the access to the files or you have uh, some power in a local machine, we can configure this in the way that the local machine power will be used for some operations. So you're absolutely right. Oh, that's, that's really exciting, Michael. I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Thanks for calling me up. Yeah, Luis, thank you for dropping in and... That's it for today, actually. That was my presentation. Thank you for listening and stay connected. So you heard me and Michael chatting there at the end of his package where we get a bit of a view of uh, where some of this stuff's going into the future uh, and some things that he's been working on with his team. Uh, so I, I want to particularly put a, a shout out there to Mr. Rezvanov for working so hard on some of the parts that Michael's got in there. I know we gave him a bit of a tight deadline uh, and he was working with uh, Alexei as well on Workspace. So I just want to name check those guys there that pushed to help get Michael some of those things. And I think Michael probably could name a couple of other guys that, that help work on the media service side. Uh, do, you wanna, do you wanna throw any names out there, Michael, for people that got you some of that stuff together in time? Well, it was a whole team. So actually, yeah, a few guys who, who is behind all this, what you have seen, like uh, services, like uh, uh, all this intermediate level. So it's it was really hard and uh, very good work, which the whole team has performed. Cool. I'm very happy. So, Mr. That. Pillbeam, uh, what do you have to send us our way? I mean, I, I, I did hear that you said that uh, we, we've got people contacting us from the state saying they're not having any lip sync issues. So maybe there's some kind of Brexit paperwork issue. So the, the lip sync fails across to Europe only. Uh, any, any actual questions we can throw towards Michael? Uh, yeah, we've got the, uh, the standard um, question of when we can actually expect to see Capture version 15 released. Oh, well, I'm, I'm directing that one straight over to Michael. So the Capture 15 release, where, where is that on the, uh, the calendar? 
Well, as I mentioned, uh, this is already on the final stage, uh, yeah, before the final release, and we ex expect to have it available for download uh, in the beginning of April. So. In in the course of uh, I think next as, two as weeks. well from uh, Mr. Jacobs's package earlier, the release candidate edition of Capture 15 is actually already integrated into the AWS marketplace and shortly will be integrated into the Azure marketplace because those just got updated uh, just in time for TechCon. So the, that release candidate's there in that uh, cloud marketplace edition already. Simon, uh, Yep. Extra? Yeah, no, we have some more. So uh, in that piece, we mentioned that this runs on Mac. What type of Mac? I mean, what version of Mac? A new ah. version? Yeah, I'll, I'll pick that one because I'm, I've got an actual Mac uh, on my desk and have done a bit more of that. And I was helping uh, Michael test on Mac. So I've got one of the Intel-based Mac uh, iMacs in, in my office. And I was trying that Electron app that you saw there uh, on that machine. Uh, so that was working, running Big Sur, the very latest Mac OS. Although I do believe there's nothing that would stop it working on uh, Catalina, I believe, was the previous number. Uh, but we, we pushed ahead to make sure that everything was working on Big Sur uh, because there were some significant changes made uh, there. One of the other significant changes that have happened to the latest Macs is the introduction of the Apple Silicon stuff. And I can say as well that Cinecoder, which is the core uh, codec and media reading library that we're using in that app that's a C++ cross-compiled app has already been compiled for Apple Silicon. So we have uh, one of the Apple M1 powered Mac minis as a, a, a test machine in our lab. And so we, we are confident that we, we've got that working. And as we'll actually hear a little bit more in my package, not only do we have uh, Cinecoder and those parts working on the Apple M1 Silicon stuff, it even works on the ARM-based uh, chips that you find inside iPads <coughs> and iPhones. So, yeah, we should have uh, very strong coverage on both the currently shipping various Apple uh, pieces of equipment running Intel and also the Apple Silicon stuff. So, uh, anything else, if I answered that, to your yes. satisfaction? Yes, no, no, we so. still have more. The, the start of questions are starting to come in. We've got some questions from Ellen. Yeah. Uh, do you need to run a web server and web domain? Yeah. Okay. So the, the, there's a blog post. Uh, and I think Michael referenced it, uh, or I can pass this off to Michael in a moment. There is a blog post about how you can put what we call the front end components up. And we actually document how we recommend or we give a, a model way of using a reverse proxy uh, server. Uh, if you just search on Synergy Open for uh, Oh, I forget what it is. Michael might tell us in a second. But there's, there's some details there where we talk about how to front that up and how to expose workspace. Of course, we can help you uh, for real through professional services. So uh, we'd be happy to go through that with you, Ellen, uh, offline. I mean, you've got a PS contract anyway. So you can just have a chat with us and we can take you through that. Uh, the uh, What was the second part of that question? I haven't asked you the second oh, part of that okay. question. Yeah, that's why you I, can't remember. Yeah, I got a preview in the break. <laughs> so now I'm like, I know there's more and I haven't answered it. Michael, do you remember the name of that blog post? Can you name the, the thing Ellen should search for? Do you know the thing I'm, I mean? Honestly, no. <laughs> not. <laughs> no, I don't remember this exactly, but uh, yeah. this, there's is, a synergy this open is easy post to find, on that actually. Topic. So it's... You yeah. Should, uh, yeah. It's describing how, how you can deploy it, what's the best recommendations, and uh, some tricks yes. how to use a service proxy. We put example level. scripts for tra uh, traffic configuration. There's a, an open source reverse proxy we, we like called Traffic, annoyingly. Uh, and we put the sample scripts for that on GitHub. So that, uh, wherever we can, we put things onto the Synergy GitHub page to help people uh, bootstrap things. So part two of that question that I know is coming up because you read it to me during the package. Um, Mike Jacobs has, has handily said Ooh. it's called Synergy Workspace Deployment. Okay, well, that's a clever name. So, yes, Google Synergy Workspace Deployment. Logically. Uh, yeah. And you should find the, the package was written by Yaroslav. Uh, he helped uh, product manage the release of Workspace. And so. Jan has actually put that it's, it's also available in the handouts, which gives Ooh. me a quick opportunity to um, point people at the GoToWebinar um, handout packs that are all there waiting for you if you've registered via the go to webinar there are some handout packs for you there um, but to go back to that question I didn't actually ask you that you were trying to remember yes. um, 
There's a couple of questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you them both. They're very quick answers, I think, both of them. So can you live edit in Workspace, as in can you capture in Synergy and edit whilst recording? Mm -hmm. And also, uh, can you provide only consultation read rights and file export tasks to certain user groups? So can you restrict access? OK, so I'll take the second one first. So uh, user operations are not yet restricted in Workspace as it ships right now. That's due to come along soon. And Michael can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, no, yep, no correction. So I think that's right. Uh, so we've got job drop expo exports. But I mean, Workspace, you can't access the media at all yourself anyway because it's a, a web front end. But you can uh, send jobs through to yep. convert where they'll go into whatever configured secure storage you have. So it, you can only get media out using Workspace through the centralized jobs anyway, which kind of protects that. And uh, the other part was about live editing. So the shipping workspace that Michael began his presentation with uh, requires pre-rendered MP4s generated at startup uh, through the recording process. And those can't be played until they finish. Uh, and workspace itself is oriented towards kind of a, a relatively lightweight, purely browser-based uh, interface into desktop. The component that Michael showed you towards the end uh, is, a, is a much more capable thing using back-end rendering services. And I will actually hand over to Michael to maybe just talk a little bit about whether those back-end rendering services would allow people to edit and cut things while stuff's still ingesting. And it, you know, maybe not today, but we where that technology could take us. So Michael, can you say a little bit about that back-end server-side rendering and how that might work with uh, things that are still in capture? Well, uh, it's it's using the same the same service the sa same uh, render mechanism on the server side as a desktop does. So it means actually it it should be absolutely possible to work with uh, materials which is just coming, which is being ingested, because it's it can use uh, any uh, quality, any streams, any files uh, in your archive, not just a web. We have prepared MP4, as you said. So therefore, the answer is yes. It, it should be possible to work in the same way yes. how desktop does. So, I mean, it, it really is. Uh, you know, it's the new thing you showed has more in common with desktop than it does with workspace when it's coupled with the back-end services. Because unlike uh, you know, Synergy Desktop, which doesn't rely on anything except <coughs> database server, this new component does use you know, back-end services to do that media rendering. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, so the answer should yeah. be yes, you absolutely would, but it would be using the new uh, rendering services that we use to make that timeline render uh, inside that app. So, what have you got for me then, Michael? Is that, uh, Simon, is that the, uh, the end of that? I've or? got a, a very quick follow up to that. If, okay. if, it, if it's a web app, mm -hmm. um, where is the app installed? And, okay, so. The web app, is this still from Ellen? Is this is still, still from Ellen. Ellen's, Ellen's she's, she's become very verbose. Through. Okay, so Workspace is a pure web app that has a, a, a bit of a, a services architecture behind it for clustering up thumbnail services. And I, and I believe the, uh, the video renderer that Michael showed is actually an evolution of the thing that, the, that delivers the thumbnail services through for Workspace. But Workspace is a, is a web front end, and that's the part that we actually have the Workspace front end components are on our GitHub uh, as a, you know, a reference for people that might want to make custom HTML front ends. So that just works on the front end against the back end services that serve media or render thumbnails. And the, uh, the, that is something you could just bookmark or you could uh, make shortcuts. That's, uh, you can install that on your premise or you can use CDN hosted stuff that we have that you can use to just point, point to our deployment. We've done quite a bit of work and that blog post talks a bit about that with the workspace part. The hybrid app that Michael talked about at the end is effectively web front end technology wrapped up inside uh, a framework called Electron that enables us to do things like embed the Cinecoder library and we can then do richer media things that you couldn't do in a pure browser inside that application. And that Electron framework, other apps you might be familiar with that are made with Electron are things like Skype, Zoom, Slack, Amazon Music, Spotify, I think as well, uh, Visual Studio Code. All of these are Electron apps. So if you've ever seen what the installation process is like for Zoom cross-platform, effectively you download a 150 meg 
file and that just installs to your kind of local user drive as an unprivileged installation. It contains everything that's needed uh, inside that bundle package. And that then runs, and that would then connect up. So as Michael talked about before, it's a, a hybrid app where there's HTML rendering inside it, but it's also got embedded extensions to that rendering where we put our libraries in. And then it communicates over HTTPS web services to actually do metadata exchange or media block downloading to bring out that pre-rendering elements. So it, it gets a little bit complicated. From a user's perspective, so I'm sat at home on my Mac, and I'm just there thinking, oh, this is my home Mac, you know, or I've stolen my daughter's Mac. I would just go on, and there'd be some web portal page where I can download uh, you know, my organization's installation of this. Uh, you know, maybe they rehost our downloaded file. Uh, so it's just a file. I download it, double-click it, and agree to install it. And then I should just be ready to just double-click launch it. And the only thing I need to do is say, where am I connecting to? Uh, and that could even be, you know, we could, we could make a customizable installer, a little wizard that would help people so that, you know, Ellen's, Ellen's organization could have a version they just put on their site to say to any of their, uh, their customers in their, their group, I just grab this, it's pre-configured for you. You just need to know your username and password. Just install it. No admins, no management. Uh, that's where we're taking this, and that's where Michael and his team have been working really hard to kind of move in this new direction that's not just running on different platforms but running not on the corporate LAN, not on a managed PC, not on the domain, uh, but still through these secured connections. Uh, and it would be up to you as the customer to decide if these web services were internet facing purely or connected via a VPN first as some kind of gatewaying stage. So that's probably given Simon's giving me that kind of hook symbol. Far too much detail for this Q&A. Uh, are we finished with this now, Simon? Have we? We are finished with questions currently. Yes, um, however, I do have yeah. some housekeeping things. So okay. all of that information hopefully will exist in some form in the handout packs that are available on the GoToWebinar site where you registered. Um, also, I've been asked to point out that there are the latest Synergy certification course information is up there as well, and that's because we've changed the style of those certification courses so that they're covering individual um, applications rather than the whole suite of Synergy software in one go. And those are now capable of being honed down to two-day courses rather than a full week of courses if you wanted to. And that's over a period of four weeks. And the first one is on the 20th and 21st of April, which is for Synergy Air. And those are now remote learning based, remote connected. Things. All remote Trained. On account of the, yeah. the COVID pandemic. Exactly. Like, yeah, you can't come and be certified, so yeah, join and, us through webcam. And I have nothing else so far. Excellent, excellent. Okay, well, that is thank you very much, Michael, for joining us for that uh, presentation and for answering all those questions with me. I mean, it's one of the more cutting-edge sections of things we're doing, giving you guys an insight into where we're going with that technology. And, and for me... That's some of the most interesting stuff that we're working on in terms of what we can deliver out to people uh, and how we can really move forwards with the suite that we've got and really hits for me all of those golden thread elements of remote cloud DevOps. And moving onwards, we now get into the back third of our presentations. There's just my, uh, this next one and then Jan to go in our virtual technical conference. So thank you all very much for giving us your attention for this long. We know we still have quite a significant audience connected, so we really appreciate this. We re appreciate the questions. The next package is something that we made as a result of looking at what we've done while creating this technical conference. So you know, I'm not a professional presenter. We like to think that we've done a reasonable job of making a live event and engaging with you guys in these difficult times. Uh, we'd obviously like to hear how that's gone and if you think we should do these things further. But what we did when we were setting this up is we looked at some interesting ways that we could facilitate this. We looked at what synergy technology we could use and what we could use around that. And so I ended up creating the next package that gives you guys an idea of what I'm actually sat in front of right now as we run this event uh, and gives you a bit of an insight into something we've created as part of this uh, as a bit of an excuse uh, to try and do something different with a deadline that we call D2CAM. So uh, Jason, if you'd like to take it away and run my package. This video is about D2CAM. You might ask yourself immediately, what is D2CAM? There's a bit of a story behind it. It all kind of starts 
back at, after Christmas when everyone was feeling well rested and thought, hey, I know what would be a good idea. Let's try and do a technical conference, but there's a global pandemic on. So let's try and do a virtual technical conference. And what we could do is we could try and make packages and talk about things and really edit them down to keep people's attention. But we could then try and film things in our Bristol studio and link people in using SRT and do all of these really good, fun, dynamic things and try and reach out on Twitter and by email and social media to get questions in to put to people. And, and so, you know, this idea came about and we discussed it and I spoke to Jan and Daniela and we talked about what we would do. So we started having a technical conversation about, OK, well, what would we need to do in our studio to make this happen? We probably needed some more cameras, we said to Jan. And of course, it's very dangerous to suggest buying things to Jan because he likes to double down. So he came straight back to us and said, well, what if we recorded on iPads? iPads have got awesome optics these days. And with the increased optics, we can do so much more. And we could use this as the excuse to finally get around to embedding the Daniel 2 codec into Apple devices and Android devices. So I don't know why. We just didn't move fast enough, perhaps. But the next thing we know, me and Jason had agreed that we'd check out how they looked in the studio and maybe think about building something. So D2Cam was born, the Daniel 2 codec-based camera for iOS devices. And yeah, the story carries on from there. We had to try and actually make it work. We had to work out how we would transport this stuff over the network. We had to figure out a lot of different moving parts. And this video is the story of what did we do and how did we do that? And where might we go from here with that? So let's talk about the Daniel 2 camera, D2 cam app that we're using right now. And in actual fact, I'm using to record this in our studio right now. Well, first of all, we looked around at the state of the art at what was available. We looked at the NDI app. We looked at various other streaming apps and none of them quite did what we wanted. None of them targeted broadcasters specifically. None of them had features that broadcasters might hope for, such as 422 color spaces, iframe codecs that would be easier to edit and more resistant to errors. Having looked at these apps and then having looked at the physical hardware, we realized that with the newest iPads, we can plug in USB-C and USB-C Ethernet. So we can actually get five gigabits of data out of a iPad these days with the new iPad Pros and the iPad Airs that we're shooting on. And we can then transfer at really high data rates to maximize the quality of what's going on. So we kind of figured out the physical hardware and we figured out that we were going to have to write some software. And then we thought, well, what will we really want to get out of this technical conference? So what we're going to do now is we're going to cut to a video that I filmed with Jason a few days ago, uh, where we take you through what we've actually done in the studio. We kind of spin the camera around and catch what we've got set up. It's quite a modest setup. We're not professional broadcasters ourselves. We just build the tools for professional broadcasters. And we want you to see how we've set this up and how we've kind of lived in what might be some of your worlds for a few weeks while we've staged this event. So we're here in the studio area with the iPads that we've chosen to use as our cameras. So running on here is the D2Cam app. So we've got a tighter and a wider shot from two iPads uh, and they're running our app on here. Now, we don't want to trust Wi-Fi. Unfortunately, modern iPads have USB-C connectors. So we have uh, just some little USB-C connectors that uh, take us to a hub and then we can power that hub uh, as well as then connect, in this case, we've actually gone to the trouble of putting five gigabit USB-C Ethernet adapters on there. So we actually have enough headroom to do some testing with 4K moving forwards. So we've built these uh, little setups. This is just a, 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 a mount uh, with a, a case hacked off on to act as our little stand. Uh, so we're actually now really happy. We've got our IP cameras that we've built uh, and put in place here and the app just sits and runs uh, and runs for days and days and days, outputting in the Daniel 2 codec our output stream, uh, which we can then pick up on our servers and use in our input. So we've been really, really happy with the results we've got from these. And the great thing is, is it's a really simple setup. So we can just pop these iPads off and use them as iPads uh, for the rest of the, the time we might want to, uh, giving them a second life. And then we can just drop them into the studio and plug in the uh, USB-C hub and they're ready to go and be our cameras again. Uh, so the studio setup is, is really simple. Uh, we've been very pleased with the way that the lenses on the iPad Pro and the iPad Air have given a great deal of uh, quality, but also a decent light pickup. 
so while we've got quite a lot of lights in here, uh, the quality we're getting from the sensors is really beautiful. And as we then feed that into our air engine, uh, it looks as good as any of the broadcast cameras we've had in previously. So with this setup, this is how we've actually filmed and will be live streaming and are live streaming uh, the event. So to have a look behind the scenes, uh, when we decided to do the stream from our studio, we had the usual issues to solve, like how are we going to get our remote contributors in? What are we going to use to cut between the cameras in the studio and the packages? As well as all the audio and talkback to resolve. So let's have a look at what we did. Audio was simply dealt with by using the roadcaster, so all the local microphones can come in there. That can also deal with the mix minus and clean feeds to go back for talkback and for people's earpieces. As far as cutting the streams are concerned, we could have used Synergy Live, but because we wanted to show interoperability with third parties, we decided to go with OBS, a very popular streaming software that's available, uh, downloadable free of charge. So we thought we would show you and use the OBS. But what about interconnecting between the different sites? How do we get our remote people in? Well, we have the Synergy encode at their home. That sends SRT across the internet that's landing here. And then again, to show interoperability, we're flipping that to NDI and then bringing the NDI into OBS so that we can compile it all together before finally sending it out to our distribution. So that gave you an idea of what we've got in the studio and what Jason's doing and how we're trying to show interoperability as much as possible because that's really important to us. Let's talk a little bit about what the D2Cam actually is and how that's built. So cue the infographic. So at the core of the D2Cam app is the Daniel2 codec. Now you'll have heard us talk about this before. It's our incredibly powerful, fast, optimized codec that's designed for multi-threaded cores, and parallel compression on GPU and in CPU. So if we look around what this app's built from, you'll see that at the center we've got the codec and we've connected that up to the AV Foundation framework that's available to us in iOS so that we can access the brilliant optics on iPhones and on iPads to access frames and compress them instead of going to the onboard hardware to our software-based Daniel 2 encoder. Now the bit rates shoot right up with Daniel 2. As we've mentioned before in previous things, you really need to remember to compare the Daniel 2 codec with codecs such as AVCI 100, ProRes, DNX HD. It's these kind of codecs it competes with. If you're recording or streaming with Daniel 2, you've got to be prepared for a lot more bit rate than you would be getting with H.264 and H.265. But on the plus side, the quality can go much, much higher, and we can keep many features in there that you'd lose normally using the onboard chips. So surrounding this core app, we've got a basic application framework at the moment that lets us live stream this. And here we bolt on the SRT network library. We like the SRT network library because it gives us a load of features that we get that aren't available if we just go straight to the native network. One of the benefits of using the SRT library is not only do we get error recovery if we have network problems, we can also retransmit the packets that go missing. On top of that, we have a great deal of visibility of what the link quality is like, and we'll come back to some details about that later. Continuing our tour of what's here, obviously we've now finished capturing the video, recording it into a codec, and we've gone into those USB-C hubs now with using the SRT network stack, and we enter into our network world here. So in the studio, we've got a Synergy Air Engine ready to catch the output from these iPads. And we can use that Air Engine then to restream it back out as multicast, compress it to H.264, or in the case of what we're demonstrating here, we actually flip it in real time to NDI. And that allows the OBS system that Jason's working on right now to pick up the output of these cameras and record that and manipulate that and work with that. And NDI in this case was a great choice for a low latency network optimized codec that we could then interoperate with. So we're able to show SRT interoperation. We're able to also show OBS operation or anything that can work with NDI. We can then take the NDI and mirror that out to anything else. So as I sit on the sofa inside the studio talking to you guys, I'm able to actually see a feedback on the monitor in NDI. So I can check that 
everything's going out as I'd expect it to, and that I'm really broadcasting. We're also able to pick that up and retransmit that to the cloud. So it's exactly that same technology now running in reverse, taking the output of the OBS station. And again, we use a Synergy Air engine to record that, compress it to H.265, beam that up to our German data center and distribute that so that you guys can actually see what you're watching in the studio. So we've demonstrated interoperability with NDI, the great open source product OBS, we're using Wowzer Cloud to actually transcode the material, and then we're using our own tools to catch things, record things, play things out. Of course, D2CAM is right at the center of all of this, and that's the heart of what we're talking about in here. So I talked a little bit before about why we like SRT and how it exposes a lot of metrics so that we can really drill into the detail of what's happening on our network link. Let's take a look at one of the dashboards that we've designed that picks up the output from the changes we've made in the latest version of Synergy Air that allows us to record and store in Elasticsearch all the details about our SRT transmissions and all the different client connections that have taken place into that engine. So if we look at this video here and this graph, we can see that we can drill right into the details of how that link is operating and how the ping time and round trip time is altering and what's happening to that link. Now, hopefully, not a lot bad is happening on here. And probably this graph is overkill for a lot of people. So at the top, we've got what are called single stat panels. And these are the things that can call out to you how hard the SRT engine is working, how many frames have been lost that have been recovered, and therefore nobody sees any problems, and how many frames have actually been dropped, how many packets have been dropped that would genuinely affect quality. So ideally, you'd tune up SRT to have enough time in that round trip time to repair any holes that have appeared in the network and fill that in. But of course, you don't know what's happening inside there without being able to drill into the metrics. This is a great enhancement to the latest Synergy Air engine. And one of the benefits of using SRT underneath D2CAM to transfer things, because we can see how healthy that network link is from the iPad to the receiver. We're not limiting ourselves to streaming from D2CAM either. In fact, the earliest versions of D2CAM didn't stream at all. They recorded straight into the iPad and into the iPhone that I was wandering around with taking some videos in Bristol. It gives us the opportunity to really try and push the hardware in this great equipment to the limits. So we can then try and build some broadcast-centric modes that aren't available in the hardware codecs baked into these products and extend using our software Daniel2 codec to add these things back in. So we've actually got modes in D2CAM that let us capture in 444 color space in HD that lets us then do better chroma keying and bring that in to really do stuff that's not possible with the built-in equipment on this device. It also gives us the ability to record a broadcast-centric 422 10-bit 1080i50 interlaced picture, which is definitely not possible on these devices normally. And this can be really important if you're trying to snap them into existing broadcast workflows. And most workflows at the minute are still interlaced in HD. So having this software option has let us experiment with a lot of these things and produce these different modes that aren't possible normally on these devices and give us a lot more flexibility. It also means that we can start to look at using recordings on these devices that can be stored and forwarded into broadcast workflows more easily. Perhaps you could be recording as a journalist in the field, and yes, it might take you longer to upload a D2 encoded piece of content, but you could actually be recording in a beautiful, smooth, interlaced 422 encoded package that's going to be much easier for editors at the far end to download and work with and integrate in. So it looks like you've got a full broadcast camera, perhaps, where you really just had a phone in your pocket. These are areas we're experimenting in at the minute. And of course, this is all very young and experimental. But we don't intend to stop there. What we'd like to do is hear a lot more from you guys about where you think this could go. Let's take a closer look at some of the quality comparisons I made when shooting video with an early version of D2 cam into files. We'll need to zoom in to highlight the differences since unfortunately the very act of streaming this video will make it hard to compare otherwise. But what we've done is I've pulled some pictures from video I shot. You should be able to see the difference even through this compressed stream. So I just used the camera app on my phone and I set it to high quality and I recorded in UHD just some shots in my back garden. And you can see here, this is a shot of my dog. So if we zoom right in here, then we very quickly start to see that there's very obvious compression problems, even in the high setting on this built-in app. And very quickly, I was quite disheartened with how that looks. But at the same time, because of the settings on my phone, I haven't completely overwhelmed with my phone's internal memory. And I have videos in iCloud going back 10 years. So I can see why it's set to this mode.
Let's now look at a much more sensible comparison. Uh, I recorded this with the Filmic Pro app in extreme mode. So this is as high as I can set the really great Filmic app on my phone to do recordings. And if we look, we can see the dog now looks much clearer. And if we zoom in, it's much harder to spot differences. And you might not be able to see the differences, but what you can see here, if you are able to see a good enough quality, is that it's a little bit soft and there are some artifacts. And what's not visible in a still is that because we're compressing with a long op, you do see some kind of temporal differences as time goes by and we're looking at high detail that's changing. Uh, of course, one of the really difficult things I found when working with this clip is it's a real pain to edit and scrub through. Uh, it's still a lot smaller than a Daniel 2 file, but it was much more difficult to actually move around and edit with. So let's now look at a clip I filmed with the D2 cam in the high quality mode on here. So the sun came out as I was doing this, so now we have slightly different light conditions. But if we look, we can see a very pristine picture of the dog and all the, the hair stands out more obviously, the sun helps a little. If we zoom in, we can see that actually we retain quite a lot of quality and there's still an amount of noise visible in the picture that's come from the sensor that looks more natural. Maybe the detail's coming across here, maybe it's not. What we will do is we'll try and package up these actual bitmaps and put them out for you guys to look at post-event if you want in a link, maybe some post-production fairies put some information on screen for you right now. But the detail that you can see here is, is much finer, and because every frame is an iframe, is very consistent between each frame. And when I came to edit these, even though the clip is much bigger than an H.264 compressed version from my iPad, when I wanted to scrub around, it was very, very easy to move around and edit. And once I loaded up the Adobe plugin to support Daniel 2 encoded files in Adobe Premiere, I was able to edit and work with this much more quickly and easily than I could with the H.264 Extreme Compressed version from Filmic. So editing workflows were better. But what I can do as well is I've pulled a still, uh, again, from a complex scene. A day later, it snowed in Bristol. What I'll put up on screen now is just a still I picked from a running video. And it gives you a real idea of how much detail is in the picture still using this codec. So if I zoom right in on these berries here, we can see that there's actually still a great deal of detail in this still. You'd never believe it was pulled from a video. Uh, it's as if I snapped it still. We'll add that to the package of files that you can download. What we'll also try and do is actually get some of the video files uploaded for you as well and provide a link, or maybe there'll be some notes in the comments, I don't know, that would allow you to actually access the original Daniel 2 encoded files as MXFs. And you can then look at those inside the free Synergy Player app or any of the apps from Synergy that are up to date and support the Daniel 2 codec. Or you can install the plugin for Adobe and look at them in there. So don't just take our word for it. Do actually take a look at some of the files I recorded on an iPhone 11 Pro that really do look quite stunning and tremendous. So let's talk a little bit about delay. I'm network streaming from this iPad. How long does it take for this picture to get picked up from the iPad and delivered into downstream elements? The biggest problem I ever have with anyone that says to me, how much delay does it add, is it really depends where you're measuring things from. I could be looking at the results of this on the end of a chain that's done two more compressions, and that would add quite a lot more delay. I could be adding error correction because maybe I'm feeling a little paranoid and I'd like to make sure that if I have any problems on my network, I give the SRT library 100, 200 milliseconds of time to actually cover over that problem. If we have a spanning tree event on our network, maybe I'd like to have the time required for the network to recover and backfill that data. So I can add delay there, but I add it for a good reason. But maybe I trust my network, or maybe I've got some high quality switches that I don't let anyone plug things into while I'm broadcasting, and I can turn that off and set that to zero. So my delay could come down more. Similarly, the clocks inside an iPad aren't synced to any station gen lock. So we have to be respectful of the fact that we do have some frame drift potentially between receiving devices and transmitting devices. But that's okay because I don't have to set up a really complicated PTP timing domain that would be able to correct that, but actually for a lot of use cases isn't gonna add me much benefit. So what I can talk about is what's the fastest we've managed to get from glass to glass, the output of a D2 cam app onto a screen. We built some experimental apps to try and work out what the very lowest level of latency we could get would be if we took all of the safety handles off. And we found that we were able to get 80 milliseconds 
glass to glass. If we look at this picture here, we can see where we were experimenting and we showed just two PAL frames of difference between what we were taking on the iPad and what we were then rendering back on the screen. So we knew that we could get some really quite responsive times from this. But then we did put back in, because we let the air engine eat the stream, we put back in some more delay because that gives us buffering and stabilization and error correction time that keeps everything ticking smoothly. So the delay you might see is going to be something you can choose. You'll be able to set parameters on the receiver to say how, how much time do you want to make sure the signal is stabilized on the receiver, how much do you trust the receiving device, and how well is your network card configured. And also you'll be able to control delay on the D2 cam app. Uh, indicating how much time you'd like to be added into the SRT protection stream. So where do we go from here? This is where you, our audience, really come in because we built this prototype and we've used it and we've had a lot of fun with it. But we'd like to hear from you about where we should take this next. Are you guys more interested in the studio streaming aspects of this where you can use an iPad or potentially an iPhone, although the problem with the iPhone is it doesn't have USB-C to transfer at really high, nice bit rates. So you could use these devices inside studios and inside remote locations where you just can't quite get a full studio camera, for example, and bring that in as an alternative to kind of a full-fledged NDI camera, perhaps. And maybe that's something that's really interesting to you. Maybe you're more interested in being able to do the onboard recording workflows where perhaps you're interested in using it to generate broadcast oriented outputs with interlaced signals ready to snap into broadcast workflows. And you'd like us to put some effort into making store and forward workflows that allow journalists to upload videos really simply. Or maybe you're interested in the higher end of recording straight onto the iPad. So you, you're interested in working in UHD and you'd like to try and push the 10-bit boundaries and see what we can do with higher color depth and to get the really high quality that we can do that already exceeds what you're able to get from Filmic Pro with its extreme modes, but that's limited by the hardware on board. What would happen if we took that further forwards to get a better quality recording and maybe focused on that side? So what I'd like to do is invite you guys to tell us more. We already have an internal beta of this app running up in the Apple Store, so we can di distribute this internally. But we'd like to know where we should go next and who might be interested in looking at this. So your feedback's really crucial. And in a moment, you'll be hearing from me again on the other side, sitting on the sofa in our office, answering your questions. So please do think about the questions you might like to put to me, but don't be afraid of what you might ask for, because we don't really know where we'll necessarily go with this, and we'd like to hear from you more. But what we do know is we're going somewhere with it because we've had a huge amount of fun working with it. So I'd like to thank you all for listening to me as I've presented through this. Hopefully I've answered most of the questions you might have had about how we built this technical conference and how we filmed it using this innovative new app. But if I've missed anything, hopefully you'll be asking me in just a moment. Well, there you go. You've now had revealed the fact that we've been secretly filming this entire live event using a pair of iPads. Uh, and actually, it's been a, a real pleasure to work with this form factor because I can uh, just get up and look so easily back at them and see what they can see and see that everything's working there. It's uh, proved really effective. And probably uh, it, it, it's given, I'd like to hope, a decent quality stream to you guys. Uh, you never know when the internet might have grumbled some of them. But as I said at the end of my package that I recorded a few days ago there, we do really want to hear from you guys about what you think about this. So this was our, we always try and have every trade show or every one of these tech cons, some kind of crazy blue sky thing where we just say, okay, what, what can the hobby project be the where we really try and do something to see where it goes uh, because it's really unique and interesting. And this was that hobby project. So without your feedback, without your positive messages about where we should go with this and whether you are interested in this or whether you'd like to get some early access to this, we'll probably just continue using it as an internal hobby project for these iPads we've got. So let us know. Uh, let us know. You can contact us directly any way you might normally do that, or you can still use the TechCon mechanisms we've been using so far through this event to come back to us. And give us your feedback. Give us some information. Uh, let us know if you'd be interested in playing with these things, and we'll see what we can do for you. So I don't think Simon's got anything specific for me to pick up at this point. And uh, obviously that was somewhat of a surprising presentation talking about some of the crazy things we've done. Uh, it means that now we're on time to move on to the very last of our contributors for TechCon. So we've saved, as usual, the best for last. And it's now my very 
great pleasure to introduce Mr. Jan Weigner. Jan, are you joining us from Munich there, okay? Yes, I am. And it's, uh, if I make sheet looking at my iWatch, it's 17 degrees and sunny, as you can probably see, because I think the light washes out the background completely. But yeah, it's wow. a nice day. Weather's crazy, cold one day, really warm another, and hopefully it'll hold yeah, for Yeah, I mean, 17 degrees will blow the cobwebs away if you get out there. That's, that's looking really, really good. So you're obviously joining from our official headquarters in the middle of Munich, uh, where there's probably not many people in, because again, it's still all COVID there. No. Yeah, most of them are not here, so it uh, has the advantage now, of course, the office is quite quiet, but I'd rather have it filled up with people and uh, us doing the normal things. Um, but we've come to use, abuse it by now, it's been a year, more than a year, yeah, so yeah, no, please. Bring Just it, over bring a year ago since I was there myself after I uh, went away and did some snowboarding and then swung by the office and saw you guys and it's, it's long past overdue for raising a beer together. So yeah, I mean, I hope we get back to those days soon. So you're the, you're the uh, anchor man in our virtual tech conference. Would you like to give us a quick overview of, of what you recorded the other night uh, and what it is that you've got in your presentation and introduce it for us? Well, so for those that have been to some of our tech cons, this is the bit where I'm basically freewheeling. It's nothing really to do with our products. It's just basically my observations of the market, not even just necessarily the, IT, uh, the broadcast market, but looking at IT, looking at what else is happening, and just picking up bits and pieces, trends. And it's been like a couple of years now since I've done this. So yeah, I'm also trying to draw some comparisons, like where have we been picking up from and where we're now, and what are the global trends? I usually throw in an 8K package, but I saved myself from doing this because uh, the 8K trends have been quite slow these days. We're missing the Tokyo Olympics that were supposed to be the, the boost in that direction. I've started filming something in that direction, so I'll maybe release that separately, but I, I spare you uh, with that right now. So the piece is called Bites and Pieces. Um, well, take it away, have a look. If you have any questions about it afterwards, I'm here to answer any questions. This segment I have called Bites and Pieces. Bites and Pieces, why? Just as a general headline to cover all of the things that we're going to look at. We're going to look at GPUs, we're going to look at CPUs, we're going to look at the latest, greatest smartphones and what you can do with it. And part of that was already alluded with Lewis presentation. We have the latest Intel Nook and we have some of the greatest PCIe 4 SSDs here. It's not going to cover it all. It's not trying to be basically an all encompassing thing. It's just trying to give you pointers and also to look at what has really changed in the last uh, five years. A lot of things have changed and surprisingly, a lot of things where we would have expected more uh, progress, uh, things haven't happened that we had anticipated. So, well, let's get going. Let's start by looking at CPUs and what has changed in recent years. We now look at what we have had five years ago and what we have today. Five years ago, Intel, that was still Skylark architecture, yeah, something like the Core i7-6700. We still have plenty of those machines around. AMD, five years ago, that was Athlon and Opteron, because the Zen architecture only got launched in 2017. ARM, five years ago, sure, smartphones everywhere, tablets, yes, embedded, everywhere. But if we look at today, things have changed, especially in the last one for ARM, quite dramatically. Intel now finally has Tiger Lake. Um, it's already in the laptops. It will come to the Xeons. On the desktops for now, it'll be 40 nanometers, and we hope then with uh, the second half of this year, maybe we will see those then coming out in 10 nanometers as well. But I wouldn't hold my breath for that. We have already seen the launch of uh, Zen 3, third generation on 7 nanometers for the Ryzen's. Now we have seen it for the Apex being announced. And finally then, of course, the workstation, the Threadripper stuff is going to come as well. So all around good progress. But the real sea change that has re started to happen in the last couple of years was more and more ARM on server. And now with the giant Apple switch away from Intel, we're going to have more and more ARM on laptops, on desktops, but really in the data center also more and more ARM in the cloud, in 
any area so arm is really where a lot of things is going to happen so if you think that intel should be afraid of uh, our friends at amd i think the bigger threat actually may be arm in the long run this is the ryzen 9 5950 that is a 16 core zen 3 ryzen as the top level what you can get for desktop machines from AMD today. Of course there's still the workstation range with the Threadripper, Threadripper going up to 64 cores, but it's still Zen 2. That should soon also upgrade to Zen 3. We just had the announcement of the um, Epic being lifted to Zen 3 with another 10-20% uh, efficiency gain. That is already fantastic and quite frankly I Intel has, has a problem. Well Intel knows it themselves. Well on the other hand, whatever they can manufacture, they can also sell, so the, the problem is kind of limited. But in terms of prestige or thought leadership, certainly currently AMD with their CPUs has, has the lead. We'll see how Intel will catch up, don't count them out. But for now, if I today had to build a top-end desktop or a top-end workstation, you are hard-pressed not to go for AMD. Yeah. Of course, if you can find the the darn uh, CPUs, pardon my French, but it's the same problem that we have with the GPUs. Uh, the, the premium you got to pay, uh, the suggested retail price is, is always a joke. Um, if you can get it for it, and then that's great. Um, but at least the last couple of months when I've tried, I always had to pay premium. And uh, yeah, that gets boring after a while. Nonetheless, they are available. You just got to pay the premium. And still, you can arguably say for the money you pay, you, you still get a premium quality product. Well, let's look at some of the numbers that, uh, that we took. It's certainly interesting what you can squeeze into uh, a, a socket these days. Um, I'm quite happily can say that my personal workstation is a Ryzen 5950X, uh, and it flies. As we have ported the Daniel 2 codec already to ARM, ARM Linux, ARM Mac OS, Android, iOS and so forth, here it is a benchmark that we did with the Apple M1 that is found in the Mac Mini for instance. 84 frames per second, 422 of Daniel 2 8K. 84 frames, not bad, but you will see a 6 core Ryzen that's the integrated APU, meaning Zen 2 architecture with graphics, delivers 100. Uh, 8 core of the same type delivers 135. Epic, 16 core, 7302, 209 frames per second. And finally, we see, for instance, here at um, 7402 Epic, that's 24 core, delivers 307 frames per second. Encode 8K 422 10-bit. Anyway, for an 8-core ARM chip, 84 frames isn't bad. It has a very low power consumption, so it's a good start. Let's see what Apple can bring in the coming months. We hear of great things, 12-core, 16-core, um, and if we then extrapolate the numbers of what we see today, well, there should be great things coming. But don't forget, we're really looking forward to the new 64 core Threadripper based on Zen 3, because I expect that CPU is going to give us in excess of a thousand frames of 8K encoding per second. Well, we'll see whether my prediction is going to be uh, true in a couple of months. Watch this space. Oops, I almost forgot. That chart doesn't have the Ryzen 9 5950X in it. So if you wonder what kind of performance that has, it has 310 frames per second encode. So quite a bit more than the Ryzen 9 3950, which is just one generation before that. This is the new Intel Nook. Well, it's the latest generation of chips. That's basically the same chip you find in their latest laptops, 11th gen. Finally has two and a half gigabyte sorry, gigabit output, has two Thunderbolt ports. It's quad-core, it has the Intel C graphics, but, I mean, compared to the eight-core AMD APUs, it is a little bit of a slow thing. But it has, and that's why it's interesting for us, it has the uh, latest QuickSync in it, and that does 42 10-bit 
HAVC, for instance. And that is really something very interesting, especially if you want to build a very small contribution encoder. So um, that's alone worth looking at it. So uh, let's quickly look at the specs of this device. And um, yeah, it's available now if you can let your get your hands on it, like with all the other hardware. That's the, the common theme if you can get your hands on, uh, on it. So let's use that also as an opportunity to compare the Nook from today from what we had five years ago. Five years ago we had the Intel Nook 6, today the Intel Nook 11. And uh, well, not really that much has happened. Well, if you look at the bottom, actually it looks quite nice. Yeah, five years ago we used to have a CPU mark of 3125, and now that has grown to a CPU mark of 10,810. So, why? Well, three, three and a half times the speed? Yeah, but the gods of Intel marketing basically just doubled the core count and they revved up the frequency from 1.8 to 2.6 gigahertz. That basically would already have given you at least a CPU mark of 8, 9,000. Um, a little bit of the process optimization. After all, this went from 40 nanometers now to 10 nanometers. And there you go, there's your CPU mark of 10,810. Of course, now you have Intel Iris graphics in there, which is the other wonderful nice thing, which, as I said, gives you the new quick sync with all these wonderful goodies such as 422. Price-wise, that box here I have here did cost me fully equipped with RAM, SSD, and so on and so forth, less than 600 euros. So, an interesting box to look at for just that. It's enough to use the Core i5. There's no real reason to go to the Core i7. You have the same amount of cores, you have the same amount of threads. The only thing the i7 does, it revs a little higher in terms of CPU speed, in terms of megahertz, but that's really it. This is the RTX 4000. Not the greatest, not the latest, but it is still one of my favorite cards. Why? It's a single slot design. That means I can fit more of them into the same box. It requires less power. It's not so power hungry. It's, it, uh, it can be powered with just one connector. It is still Turing generation. Yes, it's not the latest and greatest ampere, but it has two NVDEC units. It means it has two hardware accelerated decoder units. And this is the box uh, that has the card inside that I would use to build a large multi-view. And that's basically what we've done for what uh, Yaroslav has shown. If you want to build a server that will get you to say, for instance, 100 plus HD um, signals decoded, H.264, HEVC, whatever, this is the card to work with in terms of density and uh, value for money. Yes, the RTX A6000, the latest, greatest uh, Quadro Ampere card, has also two hardware decoders, but it's a dual slot design. It is almost twice as ex uh, not expensive, but power hungry. In terms of expenses, we have to actually get six, seven more uh, times in bank, uh, to, to, to pay for it. So, yeah, what's there not to like? This is available, um, it's still shipping. So for a whole lot of projects, especially in the HD and even entry-level UHD range, also for playout, it's a good card. But it shares, of course, the same problem if we're talking HD or SD and you still need interlaced encoding. This card isn't it anymore either. Then basically your best bet is still the P2200 card that still does interlaced encoding. And that's still Pascal series. But it's still shipping. so. You have to choose the right card for your project. Interlace P2200. Density for massive decoding RTX 4000. High end 8K playout, graphics heavy stuff. Um, RTX A6000, certainly. So it is really a matter of, of choice and, well, being able to get them as usual. Let's look at the quick specs here in this uh, little chart showing you which uh, the cards are and where currently at least I was able to get them for. And uh, that gives you an idea of what we're talking here. Yeah, the important specs for the both cards that I singled out, the Quadro P2200 and the Quadro RTX 4000. The Quadro P2200 is still Pascal series, as mentioned, which gives us the interlay support. 
So for SD and the HD, where you still need maybe 10 into AI, this is the card, especially for interlace encoding. You don't have that with the Quadro RTX 4000, but you have the wonderful two NVDEC units, which allow you to decode twice as many streams as with the other card. And because it's already Turing series, it has the better HAVC encoder, if that's required. You can see the different number of cores. Basically, the RTX 4000 is twice as fast. But the Quadro P2200 has the advantage. It is like the other, they're both single slot cards, but it doesn't require a power connector. So the P2200 is completely powered through the bus. Anyway, both cards are shipping on the available on the market. I just checked today and prices. I can get both of those cards and deliver immediately. Dollar four hundred seventy-five for the P two thousand two hundred and dollar around nine hundred for the RTX four thousand. Both are still in active production, so that shouldn't be an issue. Let's have a look at what we had five years ago. In May 2016, we saw the introduction of the GTX 1080, the first Pascal card hitting the market. The top of the line was the Titan XP, and that had all the way up to 3,840 cores at 250 watt power consumption with a max of 12 gigabytes of RAM. Well, 12 teraflops was the result of that. Now, with 40 teraflops, is where we top out with the RTX A6000 with a wonderful large amount of 10,752 cores and up to 48 gigabytes as in the A6000. But of course it comes at a price. While the Titan XP when introduced was a mere $1,199, the recommended retail price for the A6000 is $4,650. In case you may wonder why I'm actually holding a Radeon RX 6900 XT here. Well, we actually may have not officially said it, but if you followed our development online and you went to our Daniel 2 website, we actually have ported the Daniel 2 codec to support OpenCL. And when you want to run something on OpenCL, that at the moment, uh, yes, you can run OpenCL on NVIDIA as well, but on NVIDIA, OpenCL is a kind of, uh, yeah, the uh, the stepson that although the black sheep that nobody is want to talk about, Nvidia is clearly cuter, but on Radeon and on Intel, OpenCL is it, and so the the fastest OpenCL number cruncher that you can buy for money right now is the RX 6900 XT, which I managed to get for only 20 30 percent over a sticker price. And we made our benchmarks with that. And the numbers are actually quite nice. You could say the RX 6900 XT is uh, right there up with the RTX um, 3080 or even 3090, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. So quite a, quite a nice card. Um, of course, it lacks a little bit of the support and the usage and, um, well, CUDA if you want to say so, um, that, that NVIDIA has, but for pure number crunching and for the amount of memory that it comes with, and theoretically, if it was sold at the sticker price, it would be a very interesting alternative to NVIDIA. So as you can see so far, all the numbers are just for NVIDIA cards. I haven't bothered to put the radio numbers in there yet for OpenCL because we are not completely finished with that. It's still some weeks away, hopefully, not more than that. Um, we have decode numbers already, but again, I'd like to present the complete finished picture for OpenCL. But we believe that with the RX 6900 XT, we're going to really be in line with the RTX 3090. But let's have a quick look on the numbers. Previous gen with the RTX 2060, 262 frames of 8K 42 encode, all the way up to 781 frames per second with the RTX 3090. I'd just like to point out, these are 8K numbers. And on decode with 8K, we achieve 1607 frames per second, 8K 42, on the RTX 3090. So in a not too long time, I'm really certain we're going to crack the 2000 frames per second mark as well. So you ask yourself, who needs 2000 frames of 8K per second? 
it just means that only by using a fraction of the GPU performance I can then do of course 8k at 60 8k at 120 and have lots of performance left on that card for other stuff for filters for effects for AI and uh, as to encode or decode 8k is just a nice little side effect that that, that GPU can just do on the side And here it is. This is the latest and greatest SSD I have laid my hands on, for me. This is actually one of my personal workstations. Um, it's the Samsung PM1735, half height, half length, PCIe 4. Um, this is a 3.2 terabyte model. Um, there's a 6.4 terabyte model, 12.8, and so on and so forth. It is incredibly fast. It has um, basically everything you normally used to build from lots of hardware devices, be it multiple U2 disks, be it um, other loads of striped disks, this beats it all. And actually, if you can get it, and you can find it, it actually, from a value proposition it has, is very interesting. Um, let's look at the specs on the slide to uh, have a quick rundown to see what it does. And there's more and more other devices of this nature coming onto the market, but this is currently my favorite. So let's look at the numbers. As said, this device exists from 1.6 terabytes all the way up to 12.8 terabytes. You see the sequential read performance up to 8 uh, gigabytes per second and sequential write up to 3.8 gigabytes per second for the higher end models. Prices, and these are street prices I just checked today, it starts at 362 euros plus VAT. Um, for the entry level 1.6 terabyte model, all the way up to 2,601 euros plus VAT for the 12.8 terabyte model. If you looked at this type of storage, say like five years ago, 10 years ago, we were talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe even millions to get uh, these performance values. And now this is something in the shape of a half height, half length card that you can plug into your home PC if you wanted to. At the prices is certainly something that you could do. This is ideal for database applications, for all kinds of number crunching applications, for cache drives and so on and so forth. At that price, it's silly not to, to, to use it for stuff like that. Similar devices, not this Samsung device, they exist as U2 or U3 soon type of devices, meaning in, in a two and a half inch form factor. So you can put 24 of them, say in a two Rekman unit, aggregate the bandwidth even further. So you couldn't even saturate your 400 gigabit LAN connections as well. For a database, SQL database, like you could use for Synergy Archive, this is like nitrous oxide to turbocharge your database in terms of performance. It's time to look at a little bit of smartphones. Smartphones, you would say, why are we talking about smartphones in broadcast? Because, quite frankly, as you have heard Luz already saying, um, if you're looking at HD and even 4K, smartphones uh, can be used for production purposes quite clearly. And here, with this is the latest S21 from Samsung, the F Ultra 5G is actually uh, claiming to do 8K recording, and it's it does. Uh, it's currently still limited to 20 frames per second and only does HAVC for 2.0, um, but I mean, it is getting there. I'm, I have had the S20, similar claims, but here they up the ante, it's a little bit faster and, and has a nicer screen and has to justify its exorbitant price. Um, but give it another generation or two and then for 4K production, given the fact that this is actually a um, multiple optical zoom and we're talking about already 10 fold zooms coming in, uh, not just digital zooms but optical zooms in these devices, then we're looking at something. This is the iPhone 12 Pro, not the Max, just the Pro. Uh, I didn't uh, really fancy paying extra money for having an even larger thing that I can't put in my pocket. But the picture quality is great for, for what it is. It is just a 4K sensor, um, a 12 megapixel um, sensor here. But that means the sensors are bigger and the picture quality it creates is 
also quite nice but compared of course to the hundred something megapixels you have here th there, there is no comparison the the future is this and I guarantee you the next Apple smartphone will also figure uh, 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 feature a 12 um, megapixel sensor maybe still for uh, for a macro but everything else will also the the megapixel race is on Apple has kind of refused to be participating in that but uh, I would be very surprised if the next Apple smartphone couldn't do 8k um, well w we'll see soon September this year whether they'll call it iPhone 13 or they're um, superstitious and call it something else we'll see I guess they'll call it 13 um, but hopefully it will finally do 8K. That'd be great, especially if you then scale it down to 4K. Of course, you've got even much better picture quality. Um, let's look at the specs here quickly of these phones, but that's just really as a pointer. We, of course, are very proud that we can say Daniel 2 runs on both of this. So for us, there is a, a bright future in what we can do, if even for broadcast recording applications in the very high end. On these smartphones, not just H.264 or HAVC, but proper 422, 444, RGB, whatever. All of that can actually, given enough compute power, we can encode that on these smartphones uh, today. It's 4K60 for sure, um, but well, what the sky's the limit. If they increase the compute power of these smartphones and they give us access to the wonderful sensors the way we want it, then sky's the limit. Okay, here's some concrete numbers from some smartphones over the last two, three years. Snapdragon 855, Snapdragon 865, Exynos 990. So basically that's my old S20 from Samsung. Snapdragon 865 is um, in a number of other devices, even current devices. But of course, I'd like to put here the Snapdragon 888 values here, but I have not managed to get hold of an S21 with that processor. The Exynos, the new Exynos and the current S21 is a little bit of a disappointment. The numbers are sl only just a tad higher than what's shown here for the Snapdragon 865. And we seem to have a little bit of a, how do you call it, a thermal issue with that CPU after only a, a very few moments uh, the benchmark really drops in numbers and really comes back to the values that we already have here for the snapdragon 865. to see maybe some firmware updates will improve that but at the moment that's a thorough disappointment so i hope that the snapdragon 888 is a little bit better than that and when i have that information i'd love to update uh, this chart for you at the moment 103 frames per second of, and this has to be stressed, this is 4K, we're not talking about 8K here, is what we can achieve with software encoding, purely CPU based. So there's the caveat that, of course, once we also will add the GPU to the mix here, the numbers will certainly go up as well. But in none of these cases are we close to our ultimate goal. My ultimate goal is, of course, 8K 16. 23 frames is what the highest we get here right now. Give us the Snapdragon 888. Maybe we get up to 30 frames per second. Still no cigar. 8K60 is the goal. Our hope is that the Exynos next generation from Samsung, which will also have Radeon graphics inside, that is achievable. Rumors say that that chip will already come out this year, so I hope that is true. At the same time, of course, the next generation iPhones Hopefully we'll finally be 8K and we will also be uh, certainly looking forward to the latest upgraded ARM performance there, which promises also to make 8K 60 a possibility. This brings the presentation to an end. I hope it was interesting to you. Thank you very much. And back to you, Liz. So thank you, Jan, for the closing presentation that we've had in our technical conference. Uh, so we do still have Jan on the line. Uh, he's still connected into us from Munich. Uh, I'm going to throw it over to Mr. Pillbeam to see if there's any questions that have come in that we can put in Jan's direction. Uh, it's not too late for people to get any extra questions in if they want to poke at his knowledge. Maybe just test him, see if they can trick him into something. Simon, what you got? 
<laughs> Bring it on. There's, there's a challenge. There's yeah. a challenge. Right. Um, so we do seem to have been uh, blessed with several people who are the only ones writing questions, and we have another question for Mukund. From Mukund, even. Uh, are there any AMD cards which support interlacing that are supported with GPU encoding by Synergy Air? Ah, so AMD boards, interlace support, and are we going to support AMD acceleration? Correct. Mr. Weigner, over to you. <laughs> I what think do you're you going to disappoint our friend McCund. Yes, I mean, if, if there were, we would have mentioned it. So with the, the, the high and low surge since basically with... Uh, yeah, since the Pascal series came to an end, or at least the, the new ones were introduced, and now, of course, we are at Orion Ampere. We'd hope maybe it, with Ampere, they would reverse the decision and maybe bring interlacing coding back. And the answer is no. Chances of it making a return, no. They say, where I have to agree, interlace is an artifact of history. And with flat screens that actually can't handle interlace, and that we all have flat screens these days, uh, does anybody still pretend that they're using a tube monitor? At least the, the interlace is something that should die, but as we know in broadcast standards, that is not likely going to yes, happen. it's going to hurry up quickly. and die in about 20 years. But uh, I think... Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's still SD exactly. out there in many places, so let's now, not even I discuss that. Now, I do know that there should be a discrete board that will give us interlace acceleration. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Yes. Well, Intel has threatened that they are going to come out with their discrete graphics cards, and uh, of course the uh, the uh, XE graphics that are now integrated in the latest, say, Tiger Lake processors or Rocket Lake, if when we were talking desktop, um, they do have interlace encoding capability, but they always were like on the the lower scale of performance. But Intel now, of course, is upping the ante. They want to be up there. They don't want basically Nvidia to eat their data center lunch. Um, so the DG2 or, or the, the Iris C graphics for the higher market segment for the gaming and also the data center area, they promise to have more punch. But I actually don't care so much for punch. I just really want that quick sync functionality. So even an entry level graphics card just with that quick sync functionality that I could plug into any PC or server uh, would do me just fine for that particular and You're on the prowl to try and get hold of one of these boards. As soon as we've got one, I believe we're, we're pretty much ready to have it integrated and go it just needs testing is that right well we have quick sync support anyway so it, for us it's just really to see did they change the apis but intel now has what they call one api so the f the promise is there that that should be more or less yeah. a plug -in. so it's a, a, a no i'm sorry amd can't help us but yes maybe intel will help us uh, the problem we've always had with the quick sync stuff, and I'm sure Jan would agree, is that we've really struggled to find the form factor that can accommodate that lovely quick sync acceleration because it's just not on the chips that are normally in the rack mounted gear. So I'm hoping this will change with the Intel G DG boards that come along. We shall see. I can see that Mr. Pillbeam is waggling a finger, which I'm assuming means he has a follow-up uh, or needs the toilet. Not a follow-up or the toilet. No, this <laughs> one is somebody. These people really know how to press Jan's buttons because Good. you'll love this question. Oh. It's just come in from Jonathan. It says, speaking of new technologies, what's your current direction regarding IPST2110? Oh, I'm so passing this one to Mr. Wagner. <laughs> yeah. Oh, See, yeah. this oh, is like oh, the touch paper. God. I'm going to slide under really the sofa. Uh, people, pe it's all yours, yeah. Uh, God, yeah, uh, this is the kind of thing that the where, where the PR department is say wrestle him down, gag him, drag him somewhere in a corner, uh, shackle him. Um, you know, we coined the phrase "SDI must die." Huh? And I always said, yeah, well, we should extend that sentence. It's, it's not going to roll off the tongue that easily, but 2110 is dead, and it never will will live. Uh, all the proof to the contrary are just a joke. 2110 is dead, and anybody who is putting money in it, well, please, somebody's got to live off it. But from a technology and from a design point of view, I still maintain the same view that I had from the very beginning. And we sat in those committees. It's like, Jesus, who came up with I this mean, that, shit? That said, uh, <laughs> placing a more positive spin on it, of course, uh, it's worth pointing out that we actually genuinely do support it already. So much as we have strong opinions about it, uh, we also don't actually have to care that much because we've integrated the AJA 2110 supporting board. 
we support SDI, so you you see my my value, uh, the value I place in my yeah, own words yeah. isn't that high, and we'll support SDI yes. till we die. SDI must die. Yeah, we can take a along with SDI. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So uh, 2110 supported proudly through AJA, through uh, Delta Cast, and God knows what else. You you know that uh, our friends at Nvidia purchased Mellanox uh, some years ago, and they have some 2110 stack, and I'm waiting for them to basically just roll it into some of their professional cards, and that would be your 2110 support, whether you like it or not. It's just there. We'll see. We'll see what happens in this space. Um, but it 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 comes always with a safe and healthy warning. Twenty one ten is a lot of work, and when we talked about cloud deployments, uh, and some people saying, "Oh, that's difficult," uh, look at twenty one ten deployments, and you will see that is yeah, even yeah. more difficult. There's no such thing as a quick twenty one ten rollout. And uh, speaking from professional services, where this question comes up quite a bit, people will say, "Well, can you support twenty one ten, or do you support twenty one ten?" And we immediately have to come back to them and say, "Well, actually, the twenty one ten part, the actual video part." Is, that's easy. It's the control it's plane easy. and the integration and the heterogeneous environment and the network configuration that is the bit that kills people. Uh, so it's like, well, we, we could be very lazy and just say, yeah, sure, 2110, absolutely support it, it's fine. Yeah, the Arja boards work, Deltacast boards work. Uh, the problem really is, is like, will it actually work for you? Uh, and, and will it do what you expect? And will you save oh, any you money in the process? Where you Probably won't save not. any money in the process. You might be able to save some space. That's what you have to hope for. So yes, move to 2010, yes. smaller cupboards. I mean, the, the idea of IP is compelling, but we, we all have to do a little bit more homework. And there's a reason why NDI certainly in, in many areas has taken off. Uh, and, uh, and yeah. The, the difficulties of 2110 deployment make for NDI deployments that are uh, filling the, yes. that space. And at least the, the broadcast industry has, has the luck that it can still use. There is still viable business in SDI. There is 2110, there's 2206, there's NDI, there's SRT. There's actually quite a lot of choice. So exactly. Yeah. So, what what do we would you use twenty one ten for? People like discuss twenty one ten in the cloud, and I said immediately, yeah. oh please shoot me. Why? Yeah, I mean, um, we we can do anything in in the cloud certainly, but what do you want to do? Twenty one ten to the premise. Um, even if you use compression, and that the only compression in play is JPEG XS or some similar uh, compression standards, which are still. Well, Daniel, ty uh, Daniel 2 type size are even bigger. Um, so, Jesus, yeah, yeah. to the cloud. I suppose it's kind of if, if there's uncompressed frames in the forest and one of them falls over and no one's there to see it, was it ever really uncompressed? Simon, do you have... <laughs> uh, yeah, I have a sort of related question. Yeah? So moving off 2110 onto NDI. Anything more controversial like Brexit? No, no, yeah. no, we, we, we're going away from the, the controversial. Um, so the question is, can you split the NDI input and replace the audio by some external one and re-output again as NDI in any of our software, I presume? Mm. It doesn't mention software. Yeah. No. Is it on the feature yeah. list? Yes. I mean, you, can, you can currently take an NDI input and you can... Yeah, uh, no, yes, you can do it right now. And because uh, we're using a lot of NDI in TechCon here. And when you select an NDI configuration in Synergy Air or Synergy Encode, which would be the thing you would use in this case, you can choose to have audio video or video only mode. And you can take two NDIs in at once to an engine. Uh, and then you can apply, or can you? Oh, or I may have just like tied myself into a knot mm. and this, this is specifically this. mentioning Dante as a... No, but this question particularly it came up uh, already a couple of times where people said on Capture and other products, we need more flexibility when it comes to NDI. Like I want a Dante input or some other operating system transparent device where, where I take the audio from and uh, and whatever video feed, be it a Daniel 2 stream signal, say from D2 Cam, be it NDI, be it anything, I should be able to choose my poison uh, at any given time. So the answer is yes. Yeah. It's not there already because I did use a recently just I don't know someone sent me a challenge and I did set up a Dante or a Ravenna I can't remember which uh, I'd, I'd set up one of those as a, a, a pure uh, it was AS67 I think it was a 64 yeah oh, I, I set device. one of those up as an input and then yeah. used it successfully in air because we added in air 15 audio only inputs as a concept so it may be it's already there absolutely certainly I did find after a bit of, and this is, yeah, 
Ravenna and, and, and AAS 67 were some of the early, early attempts at what then later made uh, 2110 hard to work with. So I did create the necessary SDP file to then have a virtual sound card installed on the air engine and that it did successfully catch the, uh, that input stream and then embed it into the air engine. So it, it is doable, but all of that stuff is fiddly and weird and confusing. Uh, and yeah, whereas the NDI is just, oh, I've turned it on, click, there it is. <laughs> that makes, that's the part I love about NDI. Uh, but yes, yeah, so it may even be possible right now because we, I may even have done it. But it's one of those things where you then... If it's routable through route, that's the easy part. Then, of course, we yes. can do whatever we want because then it's just a virtual channel that represents itself to our, the capture air or whatever device. So a lot of things I can basically cheat by f uh, feeding it through through route and then creating uh, a different uh, new output and in route you can actually uh, separate audio and video yeah, devices. And, uh, I know that there is supposed to be NDI support coming to route so that you can use NDI's virtual sources if that ha that may even already have begun I know the engineers talked about how they were going to do it but I'm receiving my wavy sign saying move on uh, Mr. Pilbeam do you have anything else I have nothing further, but thank you for all those people who did contribute. And do remember, you can still email that email address with questions should you think of them at a later date. Cool. Well, in that case, then, uh, I'm going to thank you, Jan, for your contribution and for coming and joining Virtual TechCon from over in Munich. Uh, I, I hope you in enjoy the rest of the day. And that then leaves me to the point where I'm just wrapping up the technical conference in its entirety now. So. I'd like to close out by thanking, obviously, everyone that's contributed to this, uh, the technical team that have actually been operating for us here, Jason and Simon, uh, all of the contributors that you've heard through uh, today uh, as we've been talking through this. Uh, I'd like to give a special shout out to the D2 Cam streaming team, the guys that helped get that actually working. So Mr. Nick Velichko, lead author of Cinecoda, and uh, Oleg Krasijov, who helped me get that app working to the point where we've been able to successfully use a pair of iPads like all day streaming uh, and we're really happy with how that's worked so I want to thank those guys but obviously I can't name everyone in the company that's done so much over the last year since I last talked to you guys but I do thank absolutely everyone in the Synergy family for all of this and to all of you customers for watching and sharing this with us and for all your great interaction and questions do let us know I don't know and maybe maybe we've lost Jan at this point but I, don't, I, I know there is a survey I believe that's supposed to be coming out after this we would love your feedback on how this has gone. Uh, we would love to know if you think this event was you know, good, what worked, what didn't. Would we uh, be better off doing more of these things? How did that work for you? So hopefully some of those questions will find their way to you uh, and then you can let us know how that's gone. Jan, are you still there? Have I lost? There, yeah. I know, I know. Virtually, I mean, we could, of course, make uh, all the registrants give us their shipping address and we could then basically provide them Munich yeah. beer ahead of time. And so we could virtually toast uh, Put that option. wire. Put that Zoom, option in the survey Skype. for things we can do to improve it next time. And we'll see how many people take the ship me beer uh, option and see what Daniela says to your idea about mailing out hundreds of bottles of beer around the world. <laughs> Cool, but there is a survey. Is, is, is there a survey? Am I hallucinating that? There's a survey going out after this? On the, in the go-to webinar, if not, then that'll show up uh, shortly. You'll probably then email, be emailed to please Marvelous. provide your feedback. All right, well, thank you, Jan. And thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm going to sign off now, so all of you can uh, finish, finish sitting in front of your screens now. Thank you all very much, and I hope to see you all again, hopefully in person, Sunday soon. Cheerio. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah.